Hello everyone and welcome back to our multimodality imaging course for the clinician. Uh, great to have you back with me uh, this morning moderating this session is Dr. Mohamed Shamsi Parsha, who is Associate Director of our Ecolab and a multimodality imager also. Uh, we had him yesterday present uh, great cases. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the past two days and today is, uh, is about half a day. Uh, with you emphasizing different areas where imaging can have a significant impact, which is adult congenital heart disease and diseases of the aorta and peripheral vasculature. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with the program. Our first uh, presenter is Dr. Valeria Duarte. She's our adult congenital heart disease expert and uh, also expert uh, in imaging, uh, various modalities, echocardiography, MR, and CT, and also specializes in high-risk pregnancy. So to you, Valeria, to tell us about unrepaired congenital heart disease in the adult, critical imaging findings in making the right diagnosis. Valeria. Good morning. Welcome to the 11th Annual Multimodality Imaging for the Clinician. I am Dr. Valeria Duarte. I'm one of the adult congenital cardiologists at the Houston Methodist Hospital. Today, we're going to discuss unrepaired congenital heart disease in the adult, and we will highlight critical imaging findings that can help us make the right diagnosis. Without further ado, let's start reviewing some cases. So this is a 29-year-old who presented with a first episode of atrial flutter. On echocardiogram, there was severe RV dilation and concern for a left-to-right shunt at the atrial level. All these patients undergo cross-sectional imaging to further characterize the defect and rule out associated defects. So we will look at a four chamber stack in a cardiac MRI that show, show, clearly shows us that there is a defect in, in the atrial septum in the vicinity of the atrioventricular valves. There is no septum near the mitral or the tricuspid valve. So these is what we call a primum ASD. Um, primum ASDs can be diagnosed in adulthood, just like this case. Moving forward, just taking a closer look at the same patient, we can see that in addition to the defect, there is a mitral regurgitation here. And I'm gonna play it again, mitral regurgitation. So, why does this patient have mitral regurgitation? We always need to look into the mechanism. For a patient who has an, a primum ASD, the most likely mechanism if, is a cleft mitral valve. Play this image. This is a so short axis at the base of the heart. We can see here the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve, and here the left ventricle and the mitral valve in short axis. We can see in Sicily the LVOT here. Uh, as you can see, this is the anterior mitral valve leaflet. This is the posterior. And you can see that the anterior has a cleft here, like a piece that is missing. Um, and this is what the surgeon at the time of the repair needs to know about in order to suture this carefully. Um, the, the usually a residual um, cleft is left to prevent mitral stenosis. So if when you image these patients post-operatively, don't be surprised if you have a, the surgeon left a residual cleft. It's just the, they tend to err in the side of caution. Um, to they don't want to cause mitral stenosis. Um, I'll show you another picture here with color. And you can see clear here, clearly here with color, this is the same cut as this one, that the mechanism of the regurg mitral regurgitation is through the cleft. Moving on to our next patient. This is a 31 year old who presented with palpitations. He was told that he had a hole in his heart in childhood. Um, 
But and then he was lost to follow up except for some sporadic visits to different cardiologists that didn't get to know him well. And and he was told that the that in echocardiogram the the defect that was previously reported uh, had had wasn't seen anymore, so it was presumed it was closed. Um, so he did have a dilated RV on echo, um, but no shunts were reported. So we we review the out, outside imaging always, and 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 then we move forward with the cardiac MRI. This is an axial stack. I'm gonna let it play it once, and then we'll start over. Um, this is an axial stat across the chest. We're going from superior to inferior. You can see the right ventricle is severely dilated. So, so is the, the right atrium. So we're going to go systematically and follow the great vessels here. This is the aortic arch. This is the nominate vein, SVC. We saw the acids coming in. We're going to follow the SVC. And you can see here, that there is a defect. Um, I'm going to play the play again and show it to you again. So, uh, so as I, I want you to pay attention, as the SVC is getting uh, to the right atrium, is at, in right at the connect, is at, at the at the level where they connect. There is a pulmonary vein coming is the right upper pulmonary vein that goes right behind the SVC at this point. And in this pulmonary vein is heading towards the left atrium, right? And, and the defect is right between that pulmonary vein wall and this SVC wall. So you can see here, this is the SVC here, and this is, the pulmonary vein heading to the LA. And the wall that is missing is part of the posterior wall of the SVC and the anterior wall of this pulmonary vein. So this is a sinus venosus defect. And sinus venosus defects are not a strictly atrial septal defects because as you can see, the atrial septum here is intact. The defect is between the SVC and the pulmonary vein. See, um, and these defects are very hard to see in transthoracic echocardiography in adults, especially adults with um, with uh, with challenges with body habitus. And but we should always look for it. It's a it's a frequent reason for referral of patients with a dilated RV. Um, on whom a shunt is suspected but has not been identified. So here, just with some labels, this is the SVC and the LA, and that's the defect right there, right? So when, when we report the size of the defect, this is the measurement that we report. That's a superior sinus venous defect, and, and that's the cause of the RV and RA enlargement and the in the arrhythmias. So these patients underwent successful surgery and there are different techniques for this. Um, the double patch technique, the warden, the, uh, this, which technique to use is decided with the surgeon depending on, on where the anomalous pulmonary veins are training. I mentioned that it's challenging to image this with transthoracic echo, but transesophageal echo can be very helpful in making the diagnosis. So this is a transesophageal echo, and, and as you can see, this is the RA, the RV, this is, and, and this is the atrial septum that, that appears intact. And then if you look at the back, and as you pull your probe higher, um, cranially, you, you can identify the defect. I recommend that you always have your color on when you're looking for this, um, because when the defects are not as clearly seen as here, the, the jet, as you can see here, showing clear left to right shunt can help you in the diagnosis.
And then we have another case of a patient who presented a 54 year old, very active, who presented with, with atrial arrhythmias and decreased exercise tolerance. He had a secundum ASD repair in the 70s. And, and he presented with RA in RV enlargement. And his autosaturations were decreasing with exercise. This, this patient particularly was a, a very active and played competitive, competitive sports for his age range. Uh, so he, he could notice these changes um, pretty easily. So he had had an MRI um, at another institution and looking at the four chamber stacks like we looked earlier, there was uh, the atrial septum appear intact. Um, however, whenever we see right ventricular dilation in a patient that had a shunt repaired a long time ago, we need to make sure that there is no residual shunt somewhere. So for that, we, we do an atrial stack. Um, we, we take images oblique to the atrial septum, just as demonstrated here. And I'll show to you what they look like. Um, so these are the images. And you can see here that these are the images that we obtain as a result. And you can see the defect. There is a defect here, right here. This is an inferior sinus venous defect. This is the right atrium, the atrial septum, the left atrium. This is the IVC as it's coming into the right atrium. And as you know, as you know, there shouldn't be a connection between the IVC and the LA. So this is an inferior sinus venosus defect. This is a patient that was previously repaired, but had a residual defect that was not seen back then. We need to be mindful patients who were operated in, in the 70s, um, they, even, they, they didn't have um, the technology, the imaging technology that we have today. Um, so so we always need to image them and, and carefully uh, make sure that the diagnosis was correct. Um, we always need to look for anomalous pulmonary veins in patients uh, that were imaging, patients with dilated right-sided chambers that we should suspect shunt on. Um, we always do this systematically. Not only we count the pulmonary veins, we make sure that there are four, at least four pulmonary veins connecting to the left atrium, but also we need to uh, carefully assess the nominate vein in the superior vena cava to make sure that there are no small pulmonary veins. It can happen that patients have four pulmonary veins going to the left atrium and then they have another one going to connecting to the nominate or the SVC. So this is an extreme case. It's a scimitar. We, we do diagnose this in, in, in adulthood too. <laughs> and, and it's called scimitar because there is a scimitar vein. All, usually all the pulmonary veins from the right lung connect to a vertical vein that we call the scimitar vein that connects with the IVC. Um, this is the appearance in, in, on x-ray. And I'm, I'm just going to walk you through an axial stack of images um, across the chest, going from superior to inferior, just to show you a key feature that will help you make the diagnosis. As you see in, in, the, in the lungs, we see this abnormal vessel that shouldn't be here that's going from superior to inferior. And if we follow it down, it connects to the IVC. So that's the first clue we see. Um, we, op we, we have operated this year a couple of patients with scimitar syndrome diagnosed in adulthood. So it's, it's not, it's not a, as infrequent as one may think. Okay, this is a 3D reconstruction. You can see the scimitar vein there very clearly. Uh, moving on to our next case, this is a 30-year-old female uh, with hypertension who presented with an acute stroke um, with left-sided hemiparesis. She was diagnosed with a right 
vertebral artery dissection on an XCTA. Um, the echocardiogram sh showed a bicuspid aortic valve without significant stenosis or regurgitation. And however, this flow pattern was noticed in the descending aorta. As you can see, um, there is a continuous flow. Uh, it's, the pulsatility is not as clear as in normal cases, and, and the waveforms are blunted. So whenever we see this, we should, especially in a patient with bicuspid aortic valve, we should suspect coartation. This is the CT of this patient, and as you can see, had, she had critical coartation. And, and if we pay attention here, we can see prominent collaterals. Um, I will show them to you in a 3D reconstruction. These are all the collaterals bypassing, bypassing the obstruction, as you can see. Um, and this also highlights the importance of wor working up patients with hyper young patients with hypertension for secondary causes. Um, so this patient underwent intervention successfully percutaneous by this was her choice. We can offer them surgery or a percutaneous intervention and, and with a great result. Um, other lesions really quickly that can be diagnosed during uh, adulthood. So first we have a, a loop transposition of the great arteries. Um, this can be diagnosed in adulthood too. Um, we have, I have patients that were diagnosed in their 30s and 40s. Those are patients that usually do very well until they start presenting with either arrhythmias or, or signs of heart failure because of systemic uh, right ventricular failure. Uh, as you can see, um, this, this can be diagnosed on echocardiogram as well. I just wanted to highlight some features to pay attention to. Uh, so the ventricle that is in the position where the left ventricle should be, this is a four chamber view, just like in echo, uh, appears to have more trabeculations, which raises suspicion for this being a right ventricle. The AV, AV valve sits lower than the AV valve on the other ventricle. So that suggests a tricuspid valve. And then as you can see, there are attachments, septal attachments of the AV valve and trabeculation, um, which are suggestive of right ventricular morphology, as opposed to the left ventricle that has always has a smooth septum. So this is a loop transposition. The main issues we need to look for is RV dilation, RV dysfunction, dilation of the tricuspid annulus with like systemic tricuspid regurgitation that, that presents clinically like mitral regurgitation. Um, some patients do, do better than others and, and some patients present with heart failure earlier and we need to uh, do the appropriate workup to see if transplant is indicated. As you can see, a, 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 a feature of, of a loop transposition, the vessels are parallel, they don't cross the great arteries. Um, and and you, can, you can see here the right ventricle, the anterior, the, the aorta is coming off of the right ventricle. And then you can see that same concept of the great arteries and their relationship in a 3D reconstruction. Another case, this is a 21-year-old with aborted sudden cardiac death who had playing competitive sports. And she has no, had no prior cardiac history, no family history of heart conditions. Um, on evaluation, I just wanted to show you a, a, an image of, this is a short axis view of her ventricles. And, and you can see here, that in the septum, you see this abnormal color Doppler signal. There is flow all around the septum. Um, and this is, this is highly suggestive of collateral flow. Uh, and, and in a young patient, we need to look for 
uh, among those coronary arteries. And as, as you know, for congenital heart disease, we usually need to, um, we need to look at non-conventional views to make a diagnosis. And in this particular patient, we, we were able to see that the left coronary artery was connecting to the pulmonary artery. So this is a case of Alcapa. Other features to look for um, are a dilated right coronary artery. Um, and and as, as the pulmonary pressures decrease after birth, the, the flow reverses and it goes from the RCA to the left coronary artery into the pulmonary artery. So those are the collat in, 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 uh, robust collaterals developed, and that's the those are the collaterals that we suspected in the short axis. Um, on cardiac MRI, these patients can have um, late gadolinium enhancement of the papillary muscles, and, and not infrequently they can have uh, associated mitral regurgitation, and this is the mechanism. So something to, to keep in mind as well. So with that, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm, I'm going to share some pearls. Um, whenever we see a dilated right ventricle, uh, we should always, we shouldn't stop until we find the cause. All imaging modalities can miss defects if they're not appropriately protocoled. So we need to know what we're looking for and protocol the images appropriately. And it's important to, to work with the technicians and, 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 and don't let, not let the patient leave the scanner until we actually have a diagnosis. Um, if we don't have information about the history of the patient, we should talk to the referring physician. Um, if the anatomy looks complex, confusing, and we are struggling to find a diagnosis, we should obtain an axial or coronal stack uh, or a set of 3D images like a navigator, we use the navigator here. Um, whenever we find a defect, we need to look for other complications and associated defects. Um, so that's part of a comprehensive examination. For ventricles, we need to pay attention to the morphology like we discussed and, and not as much to the position. <laughs> we should think about right ventricle and left ventricle as names and not descriptions of, of where the ventricles actually are. Uh -huh. and the morphology of the ventricle defines the, what ventricle it is. And then we should count the pulmonary veins, but we should also assess the nominate and, and the SVC for partial anomalous pulmonary vein return in all patients. And we report QPQS in all of our patients too. And so always, always try to be as comprehensive as possible to give an answer and a diagnosis to our referring physicians. So with that, I'm going to close this lecture. I thank the, the organizing committee for having me and I look forward for to next year. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Duarte, for a very wonderful, uh, insightful presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Huey Lin, and he is the director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Service here at Houston Methodist, the Becky Hart Assistant Professor of Cardiology. And he will be talking to us about an important topic, repaired is not cured, top 10 imaging findings that can change the management in a repaired adult congenital heart disease. Huey? Take it away, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. My name is Huey Lin, and along with my partner, Dr. Valeria Duarte, we run the Adult Congenital Heart Program here at Houston Methodist. And for this talk, I'm going to be talking to you about postoperative adult congenital heart disease, at least 10 findings that will change management through cardiovascular imaging. So these are lesions we're going to cover, as well as some others, um, including transposition of the great arteries, tetralogy flow, AV septal defect spectrum, single vegetable fontan. And of course, because this is congenital heart disease, we often have to talk about the off-label use of devices. So why are we talking about this? We in the field feel that adult congenital heart disease is actually almost like a tidal wave. And if you look at the last 60, 70 years in progress in medicine, we can see why now at this point in time, we're seeing an avalanche of adult congenital heart patients. 
In fact, it turns out that there are almost 2 million adults with congenital heart disease and many, many more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children at this point. So let's just jump right into it at this point and talk about our first case. So this is a 29-year-old man with a history of severe congestive heart failure and borderline cardiogenic shock who presents to us for consideration of mechanical support or transplant. He had an emergency procedure as a neonate, and then he had heart surgery at three years of age. And this is his transthoracic echocardiogram with Doppler findings as we see. So here we can see a CT scan and we can see what really helps us to understand actually what's happening to him and what type of surgery he had. So this is in fact, actually the systemic right ventricle. This is the tricuspid annulus. This is the mitral annulus. This is the subpulmonic left ventricle. And this is the pulmonary veins. And of course, then what would this actually be? It turns out that this is transposition atrial switch. And if we go through, we can actually look up higher that the aorta is anterior. And the way we can tell is because there's a left coronary artery coming off of it. And posterior to the aorta, of course, is the pulmonary artery. So let's look at transposition of the great arteries in a little bit more detail. So at birth, these kids are very sick. So as we remember, the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta, hence the first part of the transposition. And in fact, that blue deoxygenated blood flow goes through the systemic circulation and continues to be further deoxygenated. And it comes back through the venous circulation back to the right atrium. Similarly, in parallel, the left ventricle gives rise to the pulmonary artery and pumps the oxygenated red blood to the lungs, which become more oxygenated and come back through the pulmonary veins back to the left atrium. What this means then, of course, these sick kids are very sick right at birth, right after they're disconnected from the placenta. And so a lot of them to survive, we have to create some sort of shunt. And so that's where the rash conceptosomid became very powerful in its usage here. And so in order to allow shunting, an atrial septal defect is created via a catheter-based procedure to create a hole between the right atrium and left atrium in the atrial septum. What this then allows is for the child to survive for at least a couple of years until the next step in palliation can occur. Of course, they do walk around with lowered saturations because there's significant mixing at the atrial level, which also um, in part lets them survive. So what's the next step? The next step traditionally had been the atrial switch. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens in the modern era. But for many decades, the atrial switch was the go-to palliation for these patients after they had their Rashkin procedure. So the way the atrial switch works is that the SVC and the IVC are baffled to the left atrium, such that the deoxygenated blue blood goes to the left atrium, left ventricle, which then gets pumped to the lungs through the pulmonary artery, goes to the pulmonary circulation, and allows for oxygenation of the blood. Then this oxygenated blood comes back through the pulmonary veins through the atrial baffle to the right atrium, the right atrium gives rise to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then pumps that red oxygenated blood flow to the aorta and to the systemic circulation. And that's how you deliver oxygenation to the body. So it's typically called a senning or a mustard procedure. And the mustard was typically using exogenous material where the senning was much more complicated in that it used atrial tissue to fashion these baffles. We typically like see that the senning has slightly better outcomes because of the fact that the Atrial baffles made out of atrial tissue grows with the patient, whereas the mustard baffle typically does not grow with the patient and can typically have very common problems with it. So in this particular situation, our patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation, which in this particular situation is the systemic AV valve, which allows them to not only have pressure overload due to the RV being the systemic ventricle, but also volume overload because of the tricuspid regurgitation. And we know once we see more than moderate tricuspid regurgitation that these patients move towards failure very quickly and they need to be watched very quickly and referred to a quaternary or tertiary quaternary care center as they may require some sort of mechanical support as they may proceed into cardiogenic shock, just like this particular patient. So in transposition with atrial switch palliation, these patients are subject to heart failure, especially in the setting of more than moderate tricuspid regurgitation as that systemic right ventricular tricuspid annulus dilates. They're also subject to atrial arrhythmias, which in certain situations can subject them to the risk of sudden death. So these patients need to be watched very carefully, especially as they reach the fourth and fifth decades. So what is this? This is a CTA of another patient. And as we go through the great arteries, we'll get a better sense of exactly what we're dealing with here. Note should be made that the patient has previously had a median sternotomy. So we know, of course, this is a post-operative patient. So in the mid 80s, 
the standard of care became the actual arterial switch. Um, so what that meant was exactly what it sounds like. So instead of doing an atrial switch where we baffle the atria, instead, the pulmonary artery was moved to the aortic position and the aorta was moved to the pulmonary arterial position. But importantly, what also had to happen was that the coronary arteries had to be taken off and placed on the neo aorta so that the oxygenated blood flow could be pumped to the coronary arteries as well. As well as part of this is a movement called the Lecompte maneuver in which the pulmonary artery needs to move, be moved anteriorly to its location at the right ventricular outflow tract. And so that uh, creates a situation where the um, pulmonary arteries are slinged over the aorta. The problem with this, of course, is that when you reimplant the coronary arteries, it subjects them to the possibility of kinking or coronary arterial lesions as early as childhood. The other problem is that because you're stretching the pulmonary artery forward anteriorly, it can cause pulmonary arterial stenosis. We don't know when these may actually show up. And so we need to watch these uh, patients very carefully, even into adulthood. So this is now the standard of care for transmission of great arteries. And these are patients who are going to be arriving in adulthood at this point in time. Let's go to our next case. So this is a 36 year old man with congenital heart disease. He was repaired at age one. He's largely been asymptomatic and he comes to us telling us that he has occasional palpitations. And this is his cardiac MRI. So right off the top, we can see that the right ventricle is severely dilated as well as this tricuspid annulus. But I think here, when we look at the sagittal view, we can get a sense of what exactly is going on here. So again, we see a very large dilated right ventricle. We see that the right ventricle output tract is extremely patchless. In fact, it's completely aconectic, not dyskinetic here, suggesting that this is not actually muscular tissue. And then of course we see to and fro flow across what should have been the pulmonic valve annulus, but really no real pulmonary valvular tissue to speak of. So in fact, on day two of monitoring, the patient shows up with this, which is 38 beat run of ventricular tachycardia. This is tetralogy flow. So why did this happen? Well, as you recall with tetralogy flow, primarily we're dealing with the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction that is related to muscle bundles that obstruct the right ventricle as well as a small pulmonic valve annulus. And of course, as well, we know that there's a ventricular septal defect with an overriding aorta. So what the surgeon has to do is typically they have to resect out the muscle bundles, but in order to augment the size of the right ventricular output tract and the pulmonic valve, the surgeon typically has to cut across the pulmonic valve annulus and then expand that by putting a patch across. And then of course, they also patch the ventricular septal defect. And even as early as in the 1950s, this continues to be the typical standard of care today, even though many surgeons have attempted now to do some sort of valve sparing repair. Nevertheless, what this means then is most of our adults, meaning more than 90% of our adult patients are going to need a pulmonary valve replacement due to the fact that this initial surgery leaves them with an incompetent pulmonary valve. What that means then, of course, is that pulmonic insufficiency is not benign as it allows the right ventricle to dilate massively. And in our particular situation with our patient, it subjects them to the risk of ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death. So what that means is then just like our patients, um, they undergo a pulmonic valve replacement sometime in their teens to their 30s. But what happens then? So let's talk about our next case. So this is a 38-year-old woman who was referred to us for heart transplant due to right-sided heart failure. She underwent her first surgery um, early in childhood. We don't have the records for that. She underwent her second surgery in 2003 and had a replacement of a pulmonic valve with a 21 paramount. What you can see here from her echocardiogram is that her right ventricle is dilated and there's systolic bowing of the ventricle septum. And you can almost see here that there is flow acceleration going out for right ventricle outflow tract. So when we look at this, and this is what we're dealing with, right ventricle, left ventricle for aorta. And this is where the former VSD is. And you can make out that there is probably a patch right there. So what is this? Well, again, this is tetralogy of Fallot. And what you can see here is that the prosthetic pulmonic valve is here. And common to some of our patients is that there is a kinking or stenosis of both the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. And so we need to be aware of this as a potential issue in these patients that they can potentially have pulmonary arterial lesions as well. So this is what she has. So now she has super systemic right ventricular pressure due to tandem valvular and pulmonary arterial stenosis. 
So what do we have to do? Well, typically these valves are constructed just like the Carpenter Edwards Paramount valve that she has. But unfortunately, what it means is that she has a Russian doll problem. A number 21 valve, in fact, actually has a 19 millimeter orifice. And if we put a transcatheter valve in this without modifying this, it creates an orifice that's actually approximately 17 millimeters in diameter, which is really going to create a situation that has pair patient prosthesis mismatch. So we need to do something a little bit more than that. And so in this particular situation, what we did is we took a high pressure balloon and we inflated in the paramount valve. And what that caused was a fracture of the paramount valve ring. And what this allowed us to do is maintain a slightly larger valve annulus when we placed the sapient valve. So you can he see us here placing the sapient valve after we fractured the valve ring, which allowed us to get approximately 22 to 23 millimeter um, internal diameter of this valve and allowed us to have at least a pretty decent amount of flow and get her through the situation. And then thereafter, what you can see here is we place the stent within the uh, within the right pulmonary artery and balloon the left pulmonary artery. And we were really able to reduce the right ventricular pressure from 90 down to 50 millimeters of mercury. And she had marked improvement in the right ventricular size and function and marked improvement in her NNYHA class. And we were able to stave off the need for transplant. So in summary, right ventricular enlargement due to severe pulmonic regurgitation is very common in our patients and can ultimately lead to right ventricular failure. This can also lead to, of course, ventricular arrhythmias, as I showed you. After the valve replacement, we need to watch for prosthetic pulmonic stenosis because typically these valves are replaced with a bioprosthetic valve. Less common, we can see LV dysfunction as well as aortic regurgitation, aortic root dilation, especially depending on the type of tetralogic flow the patient was born with. So let's move on to our next case. So this is a 23-year-old woman with truncus arteriosus. She had a neonatal repair with arch augmentation, the BSD closure, and of course, an RVPA homograph. She then underwent multiple RVPA conduit replacements, most recently in 2009 with the number 22 Hancock valved conduit, followed by a melody valve in 2016. So of course, this is the melody valve, which is a transcatheter pulmonary valve. She now presents with fever and malaise, as well as acute severe renal failure. And of course, I will tell you that she went on to go into shock. Um, and of course, she has a much higher pitched murmur. So this is her four chamber view. This is her right ventricle, which you can see is very enlarged. This is her tricuspid regurgitation jet, which is almost five meters per second. So what's going on here? Is she presenting with pulmonary hypertension? So let's get a couple more views. So then we get a right ventricle alpha track view, and we can see now this. Um, we can see a very high velocity going through her right ventricle alpha track. So now we have a suspicion of what's actually going on here. So of course we take her to the cath lab and indeed, as we suspected, she has super systemic right ventricular hypertension, most likely resulting from this um, Hancock valve conduit with the, with the melody valve inside. And you can see what's happened here. This is the Hancock valve conduit with the valve ring. And you can see that the melody valve is really not fully expanded within this, probably because of the compression by the valve tissue from the Hancock valve conduit. And one of the challenges with this is that this valve ring cannot be broken like the way that the Carpentier Edwards valve ring is. And you can see what's happened now to the melody valve as a result of this. So let's what happen, see what happens to the melody valve in this context. When we do the intracardiac echo, which is one of the best ways to actually look at the valve components of a pulmonic valve, you can see that there's this very thickened um, sense of the leaflets, as well as flow acceleration going through the pulmonic valve, consistent with most likely either valvulitis or endocarditis, um, which is consistent with her presentation. And so what we ended up doing is because at this point in time, she was rapidly deteriorating clinically in, in a critical condition and not a candidate for surgery, we stented open the valve prosthesis as much as possible. You can see as we post-dilate, we are able to fully achieve the full diameter of um, what was supposed to be the melody valve. And so this ultimately allowed her to leave the ICU and then ultimately leave the hospital and come back later for her surgical pulmonic valve replacement, which we found at that time confirmed endocarditis with multiple uh, vegetations throughout the melody valve. So keeping in mind then, trichus arteriosus requires an RV to be conduit, which then requires multiple reinterventions throughout the lifetime of these patients, including possibility of endocarditis in the setting of a prosthetic valve. The other thing that we have to look for in these patients is that truncal valve may become incompetent. Moving on to coarctation. I'm often concerned when patients tell me that their coarctation is fixed, just like in this patient, who was a 64-year-old woman who previously had a hemoshield left subclavian artery to descending aortic bypass graft. 
she presented with hemoptysis and chest pain, as well as hypertension. So it turns out that this is actually a pseudoaneurysm. And the question is, why is she actually having hemoptysis? We think that it may be related to collaterals that are near her bronchial arteries and causing an issue of hemoptysis from that standpoint. So how are we going to fix this? So we took a hybrid approach. You can see here that we have her um, in the hybrid operating room and we're importing her CT scan to guide the intervention. What you can see here is that that CT guidance allows us to implant a covered stent through the original coarctation and to do this in a safe manner so that way we can cover any potential perforations or rupture during the intervention. Thereafter, what we did was we combined a surgical approach by creating a bypass graft from the carotid to her subclavian, and then we closed the subclavian um, outflow so that that way we would not return flow back into the pseudoaneurysm from a previous bypass graft. And you can see here the covered stent that covers the entire system as well as expands the coarctation. This is currently uh, published in the Jack case reports by one of our very talented medical students. So in summary, coarctation is a complex disease that we often take for granted. It can be associated with cerebral aneurysm. It does require serial CT and MR imaging, even when patients have undergone repair. We do need to monitor for the possibility of bicuspid aortic valve sometimes when it is present. So moving quickly on, we can see this patient here who is 30 years old, who has RV enlargement on her initial echo, very profoundly large RV. And you see this finding on her transthoracic echo. What is this? Those of you who say premium atrial septal defect, you're correct. So what are we dealing with with premium atrial septal defect? Well, it turns out it's very important to consider that it exists on a spectrum. And in fact, when we think about it that way, we can understand that there can be involved the AV valves. And one of the common issues that we see in these patients is that when they get a repair of the mitral valve as children, it can become too tight and can cause mitral stenosis. Alternatively, if the cleft is left alone, they can present an adult with mitral retrication. And of course, sometimes these patients were treated with, a, uh, with PA banding, leaving them with supervalvar pulmonic stenosis. And then of course, sometimes they can have residual septal defects, which are typically benign. Finally, we're gonna to touch on this patient. This is a 19 year old woman who presents with a second stroke to one of our sister hospitals. And she comes with a diagnosis of dextrocardia. So what is this? That's right, this is single ventricle palliation. So what are we dealing with here? So when we look at her MRI, you can see here that she has this conduit. And that is indeed the Fontan. So in the situation of this type of example, which is tricuspid atresia, what we want to do is we want to create a system where the right ventricle is not necessary for systemic output. And so typically that requires some sort of shunt to palliate them through that, which includes either Blaylock Taussig, Watterson Cooley, Central Potts, or Sano shunt. And then it moves on quickly to the Glen, and then followed by the Fontan. And the Fontan completion is typically the SVC and the IVC uh, directed towards the pulmonary arteries. In this particular situation, we can see that there are problems with systolic heart failure, protein losing enteropathy, liver failure, cirrhosis and carcinoma, as well as hemoptysis. And specifically in this particular situation, paradoxical embolism. Why? Well, right here, you will see that oftentimes surgeons will leave this, which is a fenestration, which allows communication between the Fontan circuit itself, as well as the systemic atrium. And the reason for this is intermittently, you may need decompression from the Fontan side where the venous congestion becomes too high, or that you may need decompression of the systemic atrium back to the Fontan. And however, in this particular situation, you can see that we have shunting from right to left, as you can see by this jet, and that has allowed this patient to have paradoxical embolism. Typically, we take these children back after their Fontan repair, somewhere around three to five years of age, and close this fenestration percutaneously. This patient did not have this done, and therefore she's had multiple recurrent paradoxical strokes. So, in summary, what we've talked about today is transposition of the great arteries, and the most recent standard of care now will be transposition of the great arteries with arterial switch. So we do need to watch for the coronaries in these patients. As well, we talked about tetralogic flow, which will probably present to you initially with pul severe pulmonic regurgitation and RB enlargement and possibly even ventricular tachycardia. Likewise, we've talked about coarctation, that even the fixed quote-unquote coarctation, these patients can present with severe aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. They need to be monitored with cross-sectional imaging.
We also talked about how AV septal defects also present with mitral valve disease and mitral valve lesions postoperatively. And then finally, we talked about how Fontan can present with myriad of mechanical issues. I hope you learned something from our evaluation of postoperative congenital heart disease today. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Look forward to seeing you in the future. Good morning, everyone. I have the distinct uh, privilege to be able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. McGillivray, who is chief of the Division of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant Surgery here at Houston Methodist, will be speaking on an interesting topic eyes and ears, what the surgeon and interventionalists need from the imager before re-intervening on adults with complex congenital heart disease. Dr. McGillivray, take it away. Well, Faisal, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm very fortunate to work with Dr. Duarte and Dr. Lin, very uh, talented imagers and interventionalists, which, uh, and they do, they, they do function as my eyes and ears. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it in the next 15 or 20 minutes what a surgeon needs to know from an imager before reintervening on adults with complex congenital heart disease. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, as we've learned, if you were born in the same decade I was born in with congenital heart disease, there's a very low likelihood that uh, you'd live to be an adult. Given the dramatic improvements in the care of pediatric congenital heart surgery patients from the cardiologists and surgeons, now, 90 to 95% of, of babies with complex congenital heart disease live to adulthood, which has created an issue that we have more adults than children with complex uh, congenital heart disease. Over the years, the goals of cardiac surgery have been, in the beginning, largely palliative. That was manipulating the physiology rather than the anatomy. That gave way to reparative techniques where the anatomy was changed, but often, if not always, left residual lesions. And the goal, the, the holy grail, if you will, corrective lesions uh, that uh, not only repaired anatomic problems, but left, them without, uh, left the patients without residual lesions. Uh, did, when taking care of patients surgically with adult congenital heart disease, sometimes we have new diagnoses. It'll be somebody with an ASD, or we recently had a, a, an adult with tetralogy of Fallot that wasn't repaired as a child. But, but most of the patients we take care of are those who have had previous uh, palliative or reparative uh, surgery. Uh, and, and that there is not just the natural history of those diseases, but the natural history of the corrected diseases that we have to uh, manage. And also, as the patients get older, we have uh, more uh, uh, patients with acquired heart disease. Oftentimes, when we get to see these patients, we have very limited information. Uh, and we need to use our imagers to help us figure out not only what the patient has, but oftentimes what the patient had had uh, uh, when they were born and what surgical corrections or interventional corrections uh, have been done. Uh, and so uh, the imaging helps us not just to confirm the diagnosis, we can identify anatomy and previous repairs or palliations, uh, as well as uh, a new pathology. This really helps facilitate reoperations with regard to managing collaterals, helping us get back into the uh, chest safely, given many of these patients have had multiple operations different cannulation strategies and how to protect the brain uh, and the heart. Uh, protect the brain not just from uh, calcifications, but also air uh, and thrombotic uh, emboli. So when I see a patient that needs a reoperation, I kind of look at them as a blank slate. Uh, we need to make sure that all structures are present or accounted for uh, as we plan their operation. Uh, and as Dr. Duarte very nicely showed, it requires a very systematic approach, starting at the top of the list and working your way all the way down to, again, making sure that all structures are present or accounted for. There's a chest X-ray that when I was a resident, I would have thought was put up backwards, but this is a patient with situs inversus, uh, red flag that there are going to be structures that are not in the right location. The, uh, 
This is important for a surgeon because very frequently the systemic venous return will be or can be abnormal, whether it's an interrupted inferior vena cava that will directly impact if you cannulate the patient using the femoral vein, or a common structure that we see on imaging is a persistent left-sided superior vena cava, present in about 2% of the population. Looking at the, uh, the atrial situs, uh, the right atrium isn't necessarily always, always on the right, nor is the left atrium necessarily always on the left. We're more interested in the morphologic uh, function and structure. The right atrium uh, usually has the eustachian valve and the sinus, the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. Uh, that's important for when we use myocardial protection strategies. Left atrium most commonly has the pulmonary veins enter uh, and has a very thin as opposed to a broad atrial appendage. appendage. Ventricular situs, Dr. Duarte talked about ventricular looping. Uh, they look different and they function differently. The left ventricle has a smooth septum. The, the AV valves always follow the ventricle. The right ventricle, and the right, right ventricle is usually heavily trabeculated and you do have insertions of the AV valve uh, into the septum. Uh, ventricular aortoconcordance, uh, this is a imaging of a patient that was born with detransposition of the great artery. You can see the heavily trabeculated right ventricle uh, is uh, in line with the aorta and the smooth ventricle of the left ventricle connected to the pulmonary artery. As Dr. Lin pointed out, starting in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, many of these uh, children were treated with atrial switch operations. Uh, there's an image of, a, uh, of the patient on the right that had a mustard operation. So the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava are baffled over to the left-sided ventricle to go out the, uh, the pulmonary artery. Uh, many of these patients now are, uh, most of the patients are treated with arterial switch operations, which not only, uh, involves more than just changing the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Uh, this is an image of a, a patient that had a Lecompte maneuver. So the actual pulmonary artery is moved to be anterior uh, to the aorta. Uh, and this can have a significant impact when you're reoperating on these patients. Uh, normally the aorta is out in front and to get at the aortic root, uh, have to actually divide the pulmonary artery in half to get at the aortic root. Uh, pulmonary, uh, uh, the, uh, pulmonary uh, veins, uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, pulmonary veins, uh, uh, in this uh, video, uh, this is a patient that has uh, partial anomalous pulmonary veins uh, draining not only in the right but also on the left uh, and uh, important to know that in terms of how to uh, reconstruct it. Um, again you can see uh, the left upper vein draining into the anominant vein and a number of veins uh, from the right upper lobe and right middle lobe draining into the superior vena cava. Uh, the AV valves, uh, the mitral valve, uh, again, always follows the left ventricle, the morphologic left ventricle. It has uh, two uh, leaflets and uh, generally two papillary muscles with no septal insertions. Uh, it uh, generally inserts uh, in the fibrous skeleton more cranially as opposed to the tricuspid valve, uh, generally has three leaflets. It does have septal insertion and the, uh, the annulus is more apically uh, uh, displaced. Uh, very important uh, for the imager to let us know uh, what the ventricular function is. Uh, certainly patients who have a systemic right ventricle, uh, you can be, uh, it can be very deceiving that even, even minor changes uh, in the right ventricular function can have a big, make a big difference in how well that patient does uh, surgically. Uh, valvular function, uh, Certainly as the congenital lesions were forming embryologically, uh, uh, flow follows development or development follows flow. 
So some of these uh, uh, valves can be somewhat atretic or stenotic, uh, or uh, some of them can be uh, large and have uh, difficult, difficulties with co-optation. Intracardiac shunts, uh, very important to have these uh, identified preoperatively so we can manage them. There are a series of a number of different kinds of atrial and different ventricular level shunts. There are surgically created shunts, uh, the classic uh, uh, blalock tausig shunt, uh, which is uh, the right subclavian artery distally had been ligated and divided uh, in the proximal end of the, subclavian vein, of the subclavian artery, surgically implanted into the pulmonary artery. That would be very important to know uh, before we were to cannulate the uh, axillary artery, uh, as well as patients who have had more central shunts, whether it be a pot shunt, which is the descending aorta to the left pulmonary artery, or a Waddesdon shunt, the ascending aorta to the right pulmonary artery. Important to know about these and to control them before you come back to the operating room, usually in the interventional suite. Coronary artery assessment. Uh, uh, first and foremost, we know that patients born with congenital heart disease have a, a higher predilection for developing atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, so have a higher level of concern that maybe even in younger patients they can have atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Uh, also, there are a number of lesions that have coronary uh, anomalies associated with them. Patients with tetralogy of flow, between five uh, or 10 percent of them will have their left anterior descending artery arise from the right coronary artery. Surgically important to be aware of that because we frequently make incisions in the right ventricular outflow tract where that anomalous uh, LAD can be located. Uh, anomalous aortic origin from uh, the uh, sinus of Valsalva. This is a patient I took care of, a marathon runner, who had an anomalous left from the right sinus of Valsalva. Uh, and uh, if you're reoperating on a patient, important to be aware of that. Uh, very important patients who have had operations as children very frequently have anteriorly displaced aortas, uh, and certainly aortas that have been replaced with uh, grafts or homographs can be densely adherent to the back of the sternum. Suffice it to say, if we're unaware of that, that will move the case along very quickly. Uh, this was a patient that I operated on that we actually did, despite knowing about it, uh, entered the aorta uh, on sternal reentry, um, but uh, knowing about it and being prepared for it can make a big difference in how the case goes and how well the patient does. Uh, many congenital lesions are associated with coarctations of the aorta. Um, uh, the, the image on the left, uh, a patient has a, a, a hemodynamically significant coarct, so if we were to cannulate the femoral artery, may not get uh, adequate flow to the brain uh, or the heart. Uh, oftentimes these patients have very large uh, uh, arterial collaterals around the level of the coarctation. Patient on the right has had a number of different repairs that can significantly change the anatomic uh, structure of the aorta. Another patient that had a previous patch repair of their coarctation, the uh, chest X-ray certainly uh, made us concerned about the possibility of an aneurysm. Uh, the imaging very nicely shows us not only the aneurysm, but the uh, relational anatomy uh, of the carotid and the subclavian artery, making it easier to surgically repair. Uh, Dr. Lin uh, nicely touched on some of the single uh, ventricle pathology uh, in operations, and, and those have evolved over time being aware uh, which Fontan operation the patient has had will directly impact what operation and what approach we'll take uh, when we uh, manage those patients uh, surgically. Uh, this is a patient that we were evaluating for a heart transplant uh, that had a Fontan operation. Uh, hopefully you can see in the mediastinum an enormous amount of collateral uh, uh, vessels that have developed that being unaware, uh, going in and operating on that patient, reoperating on that patient. Uh, controlling uh, bleeding would be very difficult, if not impossible. And we uh, very nicely uh, have a, a system that uh, Dr. Lin 
uh, can see these patients and uh, in uh, over a series of different trips to the cath lab. Uh, these uh, vessels can be uh, embolized or coiled uh, and make the reoperation much, much simpler. Uh, this is a patient that had a large aortopulmonary collateral, this from the descending aorta to the left lower lobe. Uh, if unaware of this, uh, if you're operating on a patient like this, you would have uh, an enormous amount of blood returning to the left atrium because these uh, patients have uh, arterial um, uh, uh, vessels to the lung, but, uh, but pulmonary venous uh, return to the left atrium. So you'd be flooded. Uh, and uh, if there is not another uh, way that the uh, lower lobe were to get pulmonary uh, arterial blood supply, uh, we'd need to uh, reattach that artery to the uh, pulmonary artery in a unifocalization. So very important uh, to have a systemic approach to make sure that all anatomy uh, are present uh, or accounted for. Uh, and so uh, even on some of the more simple uh, or straightforward congenital cases, important to follow this systemic uh, approach so that uh, even patients who have or need a complex operation, uh, we can be prepared with your eyes uh, and our ears, uh, be prepared to do uh, operations and interventions. With that, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McGillivray, for your fine lecture. We look forward to your next talk here at 920. Um, I have the honor of also introducing our next speaker, Dr. Chamsi Pasha. Dr. Pasha, as many of you know, is a true multimodality imager and also is also the assistant director of our ECHO lab here at Houston Methodist. He will be speaking on what is the best technique to evaluate the aorta. Is it echo, CT, or is it dynamic MRI? Mohammed, take it away. Thank you so much, Faisal, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been tasked to talk about a very important topic, as Dr. McGillivray said, would love to be providing roadmap for our surgeons for those different aortic pathologies. It really starts up with echocardiography, where you can actually visualize the aortic root and the proximal ascending thoracic aorta. The different methods for aorta imaging really starts with echo because it's very helpful to do serial measurements of aortic root dimensions. It also is a versatile technique to evaluate any concomitant aortic regurgitation. The suprasternal views are also needed with every echo protocol to show dissections, coarctations, or patent ductus arteriosus. Where does the uh, cross-sectional uh, anatomical imaging uh, stand? So basically, both CT and MR, they provide a wide coverage field of view. You can evaluate the entire aorta along with its smaller branches. It really provides a superior image quality with isotropic voxels and 2D, 3D reconstruction in any orientation. This is a 3D volume rendered image from CMR. This is a 2D representation of the entire aorta from the proximal to the aortoiliac bifurcation. Some of the pros of cardiac CT is that it's universally available. It really provides a short scan time with very high, one of the highest spatial resolution techniques at a lesser cost. You get concomitant coronary evaluation and it's really better for calcification. Advantages of cardiac MR is really in tissue characterization and particularly aortic wall imaging. You get functional analysis, venous imaging, aortic valve pathologies. Along basically one of the biggest advantage is that it's a radiation free environment compared to CT. This is basically what you see here on a 3D uh, uh, volume rendered uh, rotational image of the entire aorta from the proximal all the way down to the distal. Great image quality. The standard anatomical landmarks of the thoracoabdominal aorta are very well defined, starting from the aortic sinus of Valsalva to the sinotubular junction, all the way up to the arch and the diaphragmatic descending aorta. It is important when we do our diameters is that we need to measure perpendicular to the axis of blood flow. So this crosshair should really be perpendicular to the aortic wall. And what we use is the double oblique method on two uh, uh, long axis views in order to get a true short axis view of the aorta and that's where we do our measurements. Societies 
kind of agree that probably the best way to image would be the inner edge to the inner edge technique for contrast enhanced imaging, whether that's CT or whether that's MRI. Thoracic aneurysm is basically defined as a localized dilation of an artery with a 50% increase in the diameter relative to expected. We all know it's a predominantly silent disease. The disease itself is increasing in incidence because of our aging population. 10 to 15% of thoracic aortic aneurysm has a strong genetic component, some of which are listed over here. This was a case we published a few years ago in a young patient with Marfan syndrome. And what you see here on the CT is this marked aneurysmal dilation of the left sinus of Valsalva that's actually stretching out and causing a compression effect on the left main in a patient who presented with chest pain. Bicuspid aortic valve, as we know, is not only a valvulopathy, it's an aortopathy. 20% of these people with aneurysms will require surgical repair and 15% of aortic dissections do occur in people with bicuspid aortic valve. This is a short axis CMR showing basically a Seavers class zero bicuspid valve uh, uh, with almost like an American football opening of this valve in systole. This is an image of basically a patient with a large dissecting aneurysm on a background of a bicuspid aortic valve and you can see actually the dissection flap nicely on this intraoperative TEE image. Cardiac CT would provide a superior image quality showing this fusiform ascending aortic aneurysm in a patient with heavily calcified bicuspid valve with a nice effacement of the sinotubular junction. When do we repair, repair those? Usually when they hit a 5.5 centimeter or basically if you are heading for a valve surgery then if your ascending aorta is more than 4.5 centimeter then these basically aorta will need to be uh, repaired. One uh, uh, parameter that has been uh, published and basically been validated is getting the ascending aorta cross-sectional area to height measurement. And if that's more than 10 square centimeter, was shown in more than one publication that it was a superior predictor of aortic dissection and independently associated with cardiovascular death. This is a magnetic resonance angiography showing a large descending thoracic aortic aneurysm with basically a large protruding atheromatous plaque as seen on this VIBE 3D magnetic resonance and geography imaging. Different spectrum of thoracic uh, aneurysms is basically the bread and butter uh, uh, fusiform aneurysm. This is a patient with Turner syndrome where it has a pectus excavatum along with an aneurysmal uh, thoracic aorta. This is a patient who has a saccular aneurysm of their lesser curvature of their aortic arch. And this is basically a patient who has Takayasu arthritis with wall thickening of the aorta, suggestive of inflammation. Moving on to abdominal aortic aneurysms, as we know, this is another silent disease and usually we repair those when they hit a 5.5 centimeter. This is a classic case on 3D imaging where you see this infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Dr. McGillivray showed a uh, nice slide about aortic coarctation. It's still basically seen where you have this focal narrowing of the juxtaductal thoracic aorta, and that's really the most common location, usually caused by a fibrous ridge with an abnormal hyperplasia of the tunica media. This is how it looks basically on Cine, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. This is a bright blood technique without the need for the contrast. You can see the severe focal stenosis of this coarctation segment, and you can actually get flow measurements along with velocities across this coarctation segment. This is a 3D reconstruction of this aortic coarctation seen here along basically with the large prominent collaterals that these people have as a result of this. Shifting gears to acute aortic syndromes, really kind of the spectrum of it basically uh, is aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, and penetrating aortic ulcer. So what are some of the things that surgeons and or vascular uh, surgeons are looking for in imaging these people with aortic dissection? Number one, we wanna determine the extent of the dissection. Number two, we wanna get accurate dimensions of the aorta. It's very important to look at the branch vessels and see whether or not there are any dynamic compression along with viability of solid organs. Some of the life-threatening complications can be pericardial hemorrhage and tamponade, mediastinal hemorrhage, acute aortic insufficiency, and or dissection extending to the coronary or the carotid arteries. Really both CT and MR are really gold standard. They have the highest sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing aortic dissection. Remember that electrocardiographic gating is crucial to reduce motion artifact 
particularly at the aortic root, ascending aorta, and the proximal arch. Let's not forget about hashtag of echo first because this is a patient you can see on this aorta long axis view has a highly mobile intimal flap and the sensitivity for echo for diagnosing type A dissection is really in the magnitude of 85 to 90 percent. This is a patient with uh, a three-dimensional CT image and what we actually see here is a highly mobile type 1 debake dissection starting from the root and extending all the way up to the brachiocephalic artery. We can nicely see the double barrel lumen which basically represents the true and the false lumen. Here's the true, here's the false lumen. We can nicely see the entry tear along with the aneurysmal dilation of the thoracic aorta. This is actually a, a still frame image from a cardiac CT with a sagittal reconstruction. You can see the entry tear. You can see this large filling defect occupying the false lumen, most likely because of the slow flow. It's less enhanced and it's basically full of thrombus. Surgeons love cardiac MRI because it provides the dynamic mobility and motion uh, in real time, basically, for these dissection flaps. This is a patient who has had a repaired type 1 dissection and basically has left with a type B aortic dissection. You can see the intimal flap at the true lumen in the middle is really being compressed by this large, almost near spiral uh, dissection. This is actually right at the level of the celiac artery. The true lumen is in the middle and it's basically trying to expand, but it's really being compressed by the false lumen from high pressure. This was a patient from a few years ago who was emergently transferred to us after a diagnostic left heart catheterization. We all can see here the dye hanging in the aorta, uh, aortic root and the proximal ascending aorta. Well, what this is, is unfortunately an iatrogenic dissection slash intramural hematoma. How do we uh, differentiate this from the classic dissection? There is really no enhancement after giving IV iodinated contrast. There is really no intimal tear and there is no spiraling, spiraling. Thankfully, this patient was monitored in the hospital and did not need any surgical intervention. This is a sagittal reconstruction on cardiac CT showing severe, almost grade four, atherosclerotic changes in the aortic arch, you can see that any of these would have a high embolic potential. This is a still frame on cardiac MRI showing a penetrating aortic ulcer in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. This is basically the 3D uh, uh, reconstruction image showing this exophytic lesion of the penetrating ulcer. TEE with specially 3D can nicely show you basically those highly mobile uh, atheromatous plaques in the descending aorta. I really would like to kind of uh, point your attention to these literally state-of-the-art uh, uh, review articles that were published in Jack, Jack Imaging, Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine, and they really shed a lot of light about the importance of multimodality imaging in thoracic aorta assessment. So ladies and gentlemen, my take-home messages is echo will be the initial modality for valvular and aortic root pathologies because its versatility and wide availability along with the um, rationale for obtaining serial measurements. But really cross-sectional imaging, CT or MR, would have a higher diagnostic yield for accurate measurements for chronic aortic pathologies, surveillance imaging, along with diagnosing acute aortic pathologies. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mohammed, for a fantastic talk. Uh, we will now have Dr. McGillivray come back and give his second talk tonight. And uh, that will be aortic root and aortic valve repair. What is the current state and what does a surgeon need to know from the imager? Thank you, Dr. McGillivray. Watching that uh, last presentation just reaffirms and reinforces in me how incredible imaging is now. And I would say in my time in medicine, that the biggest advancements in medicine have been in imaging and have made surgic, from a surgeon's point of view, going from uh, the unknown ocean into a very navigatable uh, sea. So, I mean, it's really extraordinary. In, the, uh, in this next talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, aortic root and aortic valve repair. Uh, what's the current state and what the surgeon needs to know from the images. And certainly, to, to reconstruct the aortic root and the aortic valve, Imaging is critical. Uh, I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, in 1960, uh, uh, in 1960, uh, Dr. Harkin uh, did the first aortic valve replacement, uh, and that was uh, done in situ. And over the next 10 years, uh, 
valve replacement for any kind of pathology really took off. And then uh, by 1968, aortic root replacement that was uh, advanced by uh, uh, Bentel and De Bono made the aortic root something that was surgically uh, reconstructed. Uh, although a very effective treatment, it essentially tra changed one set of diseases for another. When you replace uh, an aortic valve, uh, you uh, have now new competing problems of uh, bleeding or thromboembolic events compared for the risk of reoperation because of structural valve degeneration. And if you do these operations on younger patients, uh, and many of the patients who need it are young, uh, over the course of the rest of their lifetime, their risk of significant morbidity and mortality goes up. So conceptually, the idea of saving the valve, uh, if you have to uh, reconstruct the valve or saving the valve, if you need to replace the root, is very attractive. Uh, decreased risk of bleeding and thromboembolism, uh, leaving somebody's uh, own valve uh, if repaired appropriately, uh, should require a few uh, reoperations, and there'll be less incidence of uh, endocarditis, hopefully. The indications for it would be patients who have aortic root aneurysms with a normal functioning aortic valve. Uh, and we see in patients with connective tissue disorders, uh, including bicuspid uh, aortic valve, or patients who have uh, functional aortic valve regurgitation. Uh, uh, more and more of us are using valve sparing root replacement techniques in those patients who have acute type A aortic dissections. And we're using a lot of the techniques for aortic root replacement to do valve reconstruction. Not so much in patients who have aortic valve stenosis, but those patients who have tricuspid or bicuspid valve regurgitation. Uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, aortic valve repair was uh, performed in a number of centers around the world, and that uh, most of the operations were focusing, focused on uh, surgical reconstruction of the cusps of the valve. Uh, the surgeons were very energized by the success of mitral valve repair and thought that many of the techniques that were used for mitral valve repair could be uh, given to the aortic valve, but the results were not that great. Uh, certainly, you could get the valve to be competent in the operating room and in the early post-operative course, but the rising uh, uh, incidence of need for reoperation in the first 10 years made it very unattractive. And we thought about why that would be, and I think it was because we conceptually looked at the aortic valve incorrectly. Uh, when we do aortic valve replacement, uh, we essentially take out the valve cusps and we sew in in one plane uh, a new prosthesis, and it's easy to think about the valve like the Mercedes-Benz sign, like a two-dimensional structure. But in fact, we should think about it as it is, as a three-dimensional structure. So rather than the Mercedes-Benz sign, we should be looking at the Burger King crown sign and thinking about it as such. As we know, uh, the aortic valve uh, is a very uh, intricate three-dimensional structure. Uh, the, uh, the aortic valve cusps uh, are inserted into the sinuses of Valsalva in a scalloped fashion, but equally importantly uh, to, the, um, to the valve cusps are the uh, basal ring, the ventricular aortic junction that stabilizes the uh, the the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract, as well as the sinotubular junction at the top of the uh, commissures. And those three structures, the basal ring, the aortic valve cusps, and the sinotubular junction comprise the functional aortic uh, annulus. All three of these need to be considered when reconstructing the root or the aortic valve. It's interesting, in the early to mid 70s, um, Researchers Swanson and Clark uh, did a series of very elegant upper, uh, 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 investigations in uh, aortic, uh, human aortic roots where they demonstrated that the function of the valve 
was intricately related to the geometry and the form of the valve. And any change in the geometry of the valve would bring about dysfunction uh, of the valve. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, looking at the mechanisms uh, of the uh, aortic uh, regurgitation, and that's very important because very frequently when we see a, an echo report, we, we learn about the degree uh, of the regurgitation. But what we really need to know when we're going to reconstruct these valves are what is the mechanism uh, for the aortic regurgitation. So if we know what's wrong with it, we know what we can do to fix it. Uh, Dr. Al Khoury in uh, Belgium uh, created a, uh, a classification based on the mechanisms, very similar to the uh, Carpentier system for mitral regurgitation. Uh, type 1 has to do with dilation of the aorta um, from either the sinotubular junction, the sinuses of Valsalva, or down at the annulus. Uh, and that the mechanism is uh, due to the uh, separation of the valve cusps because of the aorta, not necessarily from the valve itself. Type 2 has to do with, type, uh, with a cusp prolapse, and type 3, uh, cusp restriction, which are the more difficult uh, to surgically uh, reconstruct and uh, durably um, uh, function. Looking at the valve morphology, the most common tricuspid valve uh, has three commissures, uh, usually uh, symmetrically 120 degrees uh, apart. Uh, bicuspid valves, uh, the Seavers classification, type zero, uh, a true bicuspid valve, it can be either uh, vertically or horizontally uh, situated. Uh, it has two commissures and no raffe. Uh, Seavers type one, uh, has two commissures and one uh, raffe, and that uh, generally comprises the conjoined cusp, which is frequently the one that is either restricted uh, or prolapsing. And uh, Seavers II is not really a bicuspid valve, it's a, it's a unicuspid valve with one actual commissure uh, and two raffes. Uh, and again, uh, looking at uh, the concept of root sparing, uh, valve sparing, uh, uh, techniques, very important to focus on the functional aortic annulus, the sinotubular junction in green, the uh, uh, basal ring and ventricular aortic junction in red, uh, and then the cusps highlighted in yellow, and keeping in mind to uh, either maintain or recreate the effective height with an effective zone of co-optation of those cusps. The assessment, both preoperatively and intraoperatively, again, focuses on those points. The effective height is the distance between the annulus uh, and the tip of where the, uh, those cusps meet at, uh, uh, in the middle of the sinuses of Valsalva. And normally, that's about nine millimeters uh, in a tricuspid valve. The geometric height is the length of each of those cusps. Uh, and so in a tricuspid valve, if you have at least 16 millimeters of geometric height, you have enough, generally, uh, aortic valve cusps to reconstruct. In a bicuspid valve, you need probably at least 20 millimeters of cusp. So in the preoperative assessment on the imaging, looking at each one of the individual aortic valve cusps, looking at its uh, effective height and its geometric height, can be very important in how we reconstruct those valves uh, in the operating room. And here you can see the measurements that we like to see uh, in the different uh, views uh, on the echo to determine preoperatively, again, what's the mechanism of the uh, aortic valve function or dysfunction. In the operating room, uh, we can, there, there are different tools or calipers that we have where we can measure the same thing. Uh, again, looking at the effective height of each of the cusps, uh, as well as what the diameter of the, uh, of the aortic annulus or the basal ring is uh, in the sinotubular junction, with keeping in mind those are what we want to reconstruct into the normal geometric relationships. And what that pathology is will directly uh, result in how we go about trying to reconstruct that valve 
uh, or that root. And this is a, a surgical view uh, into the aortic root. Uh, when you have a prolapsing cusp, whether it's a tricuspid valve, uh, like in this image, or a bicuspid valve, using uh, central uh, plication sutures, you can raise the height of that cusp to increase the effective height uh, of, that, uh, of that valve cusp and allow the uh, zone of cooptation for all three in a tricuspid or both in a bicuspid valve uh, to have a good zone of cooptation. There have been, uh, over the last 30 years, several iterations of valve sparing uh, root replacements. Initially, it started as a uh, remodeling technique where the sinuses of Valsalva were uh, removed, uh, but the uh, basal uh, ring uh, was left intact, and that was fine if the basal ring was fine, not so fine if it was um, uh, dilated. And we've gone from using a straight tube to plicating a bigger tube, uh, and uh, now we have uh, um, anatomically uh, correct tubes, which I'll show in a minute. Very uh, critical part of the operation is to dissect down below the level of the aortic valve and the valve annulus. So essentially separate the left ventricular outflow tract from the surrounding structures. And when you're first learning how to do this surgically, it takes a leap of faith to, to mobilize that. And in this photo, the um, uh, uh, coronary arteries have been separated from the sinus of Valsalva. The tissue around the aortic valve and the sinus of Valsalva have been um, resected, leaving just a small rim around each of the cusps. And again, the most important thing is dissecting down around the left ventricular outflow tract. And as I mentioned, we now have graphs that uh, you can measure to the appropriate size either by a complicated formula or, as it turns out, just measuring the distance uh, of the uh, interleaflet triangle from the nadir of the cusps to the top of the commissure. In that, geometrically, just like Swanson and Clark uh, taught us, is proportionally related to the diameter of the uh, sinotubular junction and the basal ring, and that can help us choose that uh, appropriate graft. We put in um, in, uh, we, we put in uh, sutures below the level of the aortic valve from inside the left ventricular outflow tract to outside that left ventricular outflow tract. Uh, and then those uh, sutures are placed through the base of your graft. The valve cusps and the commissures are intersuscepted into the graft. And those basal or sutures tied into place, which will stabilize the first part of the uh, a functional aortic annulus, which is the basal uh, ring. Uh, then uh, we sew that rim of aorta uh, uh, to the graft, being very uh, um, uh, precise in how we position the commissures so that in a tricuspid valve, they're at 120 degrees apart uh, and at the top of the sinotubular junction of the graft. Uh, and uh, so you recreate that effective height and that zone of co-optation. Once we're done uh, with the surgical reconstruction, we again do the measurements in the operating room to make sure that we have uh, symmetric leaflets, uh, 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 symmetric cusps, that we have an effective height and a good zone of co-optation. Uh, when we come off uh, bypass, uh, uh, we uh, really count on the imaging either by the cardiac anesthesiologist or cardiologist, to look at all of the measurements that we need to know. Uh, we want to make sure that, the, that there's no billowing of the cusp so that the, each of the cusps are above the level of the annulus, that there is a good effective height. We'd like that to be somewhere between 6 to 12 millimeters, that the zone of co-optation uh, is at least uh, 4 millimeters. Uh, if there is some regurgitation, um, whether it's central or whether it's uh, eccentric, uh, it's important to know that, and that is the time to identify what the mechanism uh, of that is so you can go back on and reconstruct it. This is an algorithm from the group in Belgium who has a tremendous experience. Uh, and uh, in those uh, patients that had uh, coaptation above the level of the annulus, so no billowing, uh, if, there was, if there was billowing, uh, the concern uh, for recurrent aortic regurgitation 
was, uh, I would say, unacceptably high. Uh, if there was no billowing, so if all of the cusps were above the level of the annulus, they looked at if there was any degree of residual aortic regurgitation. If yes, they looked at the coaptation length. And if it was greater than four millimeters, the likelihood of recurrence was quite low and satisfactory. If there was uh, no residual aortic regurgitation, the need for reoperation over a very long period of time is quite low. If you look at the outcomes uh, of valve sparing aortic root replacements, and that's in the black line uh, over a 20 year period, and that's compared with age and gender match controls without aortic valve pathology, the, the long term survival is quite good. Uh, looking at the need for re intervention or freedom from reoperation, for those patients that get a reimplantation technique, again, the need for reoperation, if done effectively and appropriately, is incredibly low over a 20 year period. And if you compare it with patients who have had either a uh, biologic uh, a root replacement, uh, shown in the red, uh, or a mechanical, uh, root replacement, uh, shown in the blue. Uh, aortic valve sparing uh, procedures, shown in the green, are, significant, are, are associated with significantly fewer uh, valve-related uh, events over time, making it a very attractive option for our patients. So in summary, uh, aortic valve repair and valve sparing aortic root replacements are safe, effective, and durable uh, if done appropriately in appropriate patients. It is critical to understand how the aortic valve uh, normally functions and what the, f what the dysfunction is uh, in the valve. And that's done by a careful preoperative and intraoperative uh, assessment. Once you can define the mechanisms, you can set a strategy for how you're gonna fix it, focusing on the functional aortic annulus, a goal-directed uh, repair, and very carefully and critically doing a post-repair assessment. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Tom, I think that, that was uh, phenomenal. <clears throat> Tells us also that, yes, you can repair them if you're an expert, and also if you have all the imaging tools that, that you could do. Question to you, since we have you here, is, how about a patient who is conceivably in their 40s and who can have a repair and uh, saving them from a uh, mechanical valve so that down the line they can have a bioprosthetic valve? What's your approach to that? So I, I think it's, uh, <coughs> it, it's, it's very easy to continue to do what we've done is just to replace that with a mechanical valve. And as the data uh, shows that uh, that's associated with significant morbidity and mortality over time. Uh, and so uh, I would suggest that all of those patients with, regurg with regurgitation, that is, or aneurysm uh, with a functional aortic regurgitation should be considered for a valve repair. And, and, and I would say, uh, if done appropriately, won't need to look forward to a bioprosthetic when they get older, hopefully won't need to look forward to anything other than good, long, healthy life. Certainly. With, with able hands, I think we <laughs> they could look forward to that. Um, and I, I'll tell you also from what I see of patients referred, um, at times I have the concern that people, if they see significant aortic regurgitation, they rush into an intervention. And uh, this is not like mitral regurgitation. And I think uh, you have to have able hands to be able to repair them and, and select the appropriate patients. But there is always this concern. If you have significant aortic regurgitation, even severe aortic regurgitation, a rush from many physicians, including surgeons, to do something about the aortic valve rather than going by the guideline directed medical therapy and watchful wait, looking at the aorta, looking at the ventricle, and making that, making that decision. Knowing that, that there are some issues nowadays, and people are raising them in the literature, that maybe the classic, uh, you know, uh, 
one uh, recommendations may be a bit too late, so you have to use your judgment in that situation and take a look at the symptoms, the remodeling of the ventricle, so many other things. I agree. With <coughs> you. I mean, you don't want to be too late, but it's not necessary to be early either. Uh, and, and I think it does, just like we've, there's been tremendous success over the last several decades with mitral valve repair. And I think most patients with with mitral regurgitation can look forward to a mitral valve repair. And I think that with our advancing understanding of aortic valve pathology, I hope that we will be able to offer to patients with aortic regurgitation the same kind of reparative strategies that we have for mitral valve repair. Well, thank you very much for your insights this morning on both congenital as well as uh, aorta surgery. All right, so moving on to our next speaker, it is truly a privilege and an honor to introduce Dr. Alan Lumsden, who is Professor of Cardiovascular Surgery and the Chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery here at Houston Methodist. He also holds the Walter Fondren Presidential Distinguished Endow Chair, and he is also putting imagers on the hotspot with his talk, Percutaneous Interventions for Aortic Aneurysm. What does the clinician need to know does what does the surgeon want to know from the imager prior to and after the procedure? Dr. Lumsden, please join us. Well, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present today on percutaneous interventions for aortic aneurysms. What do we need to know from an imaging standpoint? The most important thing is to keep the aorta happy. And this is an unadulterated CT scan with a patient's stent graft and some calcification form in the mouth. So our goal in life is to make aneurysms happy. And we're going to do that through imaging. Here are some of my conflicts. A little bit about the demographics of aortic aneurysms. Most are asymptomatic, most are never detected, and the majority of those that are detected are often detected incidentally. A few are found by uh, diligent practitioners who examine the patient, but in the Texas sized patient, those can be very difficult to feel. The aneurysm uh, lives in your abdomen above your umbilicus. The aorta divides at the level of your umbilicus, and so it's often misconception is often in the lower abdomen. In fact, it actually lives between the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. Maybe 200,000 people a year diagnosed with aortic aneurysms and about 15,000 die each year from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. <clears throat> so the reason for detection is so that we can intervene and prevent rupture. The mortality rate from ruptured aneurysm when you reach the hospital remains about 50%. More common in men than they are in women, more common over the age of 60. So the most common location for an aneurysm is the infrarenal aorta uh, and following that the most common area for a dissection happens to be in the ascending aorta. So there are clearly differences in the pathophysiology of the aortic wall depending upon which area of the aorta you happen to be in. An aneurysm is defined as one and a half times dilation compared with the adjacent normal aorta. And the reason that, that we are predominantly driven by the diameter of the aneurysm because the diameter of the aneurysm predicts the risk of rupture. And here you can see a few studies on rupture rate. When your aneurysm is below five centimeters, the risk of rupture is relatively low. And again, while we're considering risk benefit ratio, that's a very important factor. Once an aneurysm hits about five and a half centimeters, then the risk of rupture starts to increase exponentially. So you can see you can get up to an aneurysm in the seven to eight diameter. It's usually the order of 20 to 30 percent per year. Rupture rate is really what we're talking about. So you've got to have a reason for not fixing an aneurysm, you know, that's at that size. So when the patient always says to us, what's going to get me first doc, then we have to risk stratify these patients. Is it COPD? Is it coronary artery disease versus the risk of rupture? an aneurysm and the most important thing in terms of rupture is the diameter but it has to be a true diameter not a length not basically an angulated diameter a true diameter and that's where multiplanar reconstruction and making sure that we're measuring orthogonal to the central line is very important because that's an area of great confusion to patients now we think about aneurysms in three phases when we're the diagnostic phase and then monitoring phase during the intervention and then the follow-up. The imaging requirements are completely different. In terms of diagnosis, most are diagnosed with ultrasound or a CT scan. Now, when we plan to do the procedure, we need thin cuts, ideally about one and a half millimeters. That is increasingly important now that we're putting branch grafts into the renals and the celiac and the SMA. If you get those, the fabrication of those grafts off by three, four millimeters can make a 
big difference in trying to cannulate these vessels. But if it's simple, th average size patient following the patient because the aneurysm is down in the three and a half to four centimeter range, then an annual, perhaps biannual uh, ultrasound is, is more, than, more than adequate. But the CT scan is necessary when we're going to go ahead and do the intervention. When we're doing the intervention, increasing the CT scan has been imported and fused. So how that CAT scan is done and optimizing that pre-op CT scan is not just important for procedure planning, it's increasingly important for procedure execution because we use that image to fuse on top of the patient. The other part of that is angiography. If the patient has a neurotic dissection, we use intraoperative TEE and intraoperative IVUS. And there are some new paradigms in terms of the image and we're going to go on to talk about. So each of these things basically has different strengths and weaknesses. X-rays occasionally diagnose this because the wall of the aorta is calcified and occasionally you have a patient has back pain, the aorta sits on top of the back and they get an x-ray for the lumbar spine and the lumbar spine looks okay but there's a big old calcified aneurysm which may be eroding the front of the spine and that can be how it's picked up. Uh, B mode, good follow-up tools I've said, CT, CT angiography, MR to some extent are being used as pre-operative planning tools but increasingly both MR and CT are, can be fused on top of the patient. The advantage of that is it minimizes the amount of dye that we've got to, pay, to give the patient when we're doing an angiogram and IVUS is absolutely fundamental when we're doing uh, dissections to make sure we're in the true lumen. And there's an example of using an IVUS to actually look at a section. It's nice because it really looks like a CAT scan and cross section and you can relate it very easily. Here you can see the flap of the dissection moving backwards and forwards with systole and diastole. So what about, what are the basics? We're going to go ahead and intervene with the patients. We operate based upon the diameter of the aneurysm or symptoms of the aneurysm. Most aneurysms are asymptomatic. When an aneurysm becomes symptomatic, then we're going to go ahead and operate them almost regardless of what the size is. When endografts, basically, the majority of endografts are being placed in an infrarenal aorta. And what we're looking at there is what we call the seal zones. Essentially, the way these grafts work is it's a pressure fit that sits inside the aorta. If the aorta measures 28 millimeters in diameter, then we're going to put in a 31 millimeter graft. So it pushes up on the inside of the aorta as we're actually... Um, uh, uh, that's the way essentially it works in seals. So you've got to have an area that seals top and bottom of the aneurysm in order to actually make this effective. Uh, it can bridge the aneurysm, but it's got to seal at the top and the bottom. So what's important to us is what is that seal zone? And this changes continuously. When endographs first started, we want a two centimeter seal zone, went down to 15 millimeter seal zone. Now some of them down, are down to five millimeter seal zone. But that's pretty minimal to actually create a seal at the top of one of these aneurysms. Uh, iliacs, the things that are important to us are iliac tortuosity, iliac diameter. Uh, one of the things that really helped us, particularly with the imaging, is of course the development of TAVRs, where you're now imaging the entire stream and the diameter. Uh, these uh, things that are relevant to us are also relevant in the uh, delivery of, of a TAVR. So tortuosity, diameter, calcification. And the other thing that's relevant to us is IMA patency. Remember, we're going to cover the inferior mesenteric artery. And so you're going to look really good. If the inferior mesenteric artery is patent, the next thing that we look at is the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac. It is very important that those basically are both uh, patent and don't have stenosis because that IMA may be patent for a reason. In the majority of aneurysms, the IMA is not patent. We're also highly interested in the internal iliac arteries because occasionally we've got to embolize these. If there's an internal iliac artery aneurysm or a common iliac artery aneurysm that extends to the bifurcation and retaining some sort of pelvic circulation is obviously extremely important. So again, these rules change all the time. We look at the neck, the neck length and neck diameter and we look at the iliac seal zones, but increasingly because of their ability to put branches down in the internal iliac, those seal zones that we look at really are dependent upon what the patient's anatomical anatomy is of the aortic aneurysm. It's important. Long necks, top and bottom, always good. And it's very important that the measurements we get are true orthogonal measurements, that we, we draw a center line down the aorta, we take into consideration the angulation and make sure that those diameters are actually true diameters. Obviously, if you cut the aorta in an ellipse, it looks a lot bigger uh, than it would otherwise, and that's very important to us. If you look at the scan space on your right, what's important also is the quality of the neck. Right below the renal arteries, you can see a rim of thrombus that's really present there. 
and thrombus is not a good seal zone. And so if we see thrombus that goes all the way up to the uh, renal arteries, particularly if it's circumferential, more than two to three millimeters thick, then you gotta move the seal zone further up into more normal aorta. So those are the other things that we're gonna be looking at. The wires and the catheters, when we're doing this, all go up into uh, the distal aortic arch, sometimes over the aortic arch. So the amount of disease that's present in the aortic arch, the risk of stroke is also an important feature for us. And so the, the absolute uh, gold standard is taking one half millimeter slices, basically all the way down through the entire aorta, down to the groins, tells us about access, tells about the internal iliacs, and allows us to plan this operation. How we use these endographs, and unfortunately how different manufacturers size these endographs, you don't need to know about. I barely know how to do that because they're all a little different. Is it an internal diameter? I mean, lumen to lumen is an outer diameter. They actually tend to measure these differently. But those measurements for each individual manufacturer are done in a very specific way. Then you translate into a sizing table that they have, and, and using that you actually figure out how many pieces of this erector set, what diameter and what length we're actually going to use to go ahead and treat these patients. And, and the, this essentially uh, is the planning device really for the gore excluder graft. Uh, this is a PTFE covered graft. It's made of nitinol. And essentially you can see some of the complexities in terms of figuring out the angle of the neck because whether the device will conform to that, figuring out what these lengths are. You look at that table and you uh, design really what the, the treatment plan is going to be. And th this is a fundamentally important part of this. I've kind of talked a little bit about some of these things, how they recommend that this actually get measured. There are internal to internal diameter, don't measure the calcium included in it, and, be, and, and we're looking for minimal amount of thrombus really in the aortic neck. The delivery of this, I probably don't need to dwell on this, I'm sure this is going to be covered by the TAVR group, but the, the big fear in putting an oversized device up through an internal iliac artery is that we're going to rupture the iliac artery. Patients will exsanguinate very rapidly from this, and so there are a variety of different techniques have been developed to control this, but the bottom line is that tortuosity, circumferential calcification, and small diameters are a recipe for disaster, and it's the reason that alternate delivery systems pathways can actually be utilized. Once you've been implanted, then you move into the follow-up phase. And follow-up is really primarily about detection of end leaks. Do we lose that seal zone, top or bottom? Top's a type 1A, bottom's a type uh, 1B. They're pretty uncommon, actually. But what is common is a type 2 end leak, where we have reverse throw in the lumbar arteries. Remember, no, blood normally comes down through the aorta and out through the lumbar arteries. Uh, when you put a stent graft up through the middle of it, blood flow reverses and comes back in through the lumbar arteries and flows in the aneurysm sac. And you see this in about 20-30% of patients. And sometimes these lumbars are big and there can be a lot of blood coming in them. We can identify these using uh, ultrasound. If we're going to operate on them, we do CT. In our group, we do dynamic CT, focusing on the aorta, so we know what the inflow and outflow vessels are actually are. And this is because when we did our open surgery, the first thing we did when we opened the aneurysm was over sew these lumbars. You can't do this with a stink graft and you deal with this reverse flow. This is the Achilles heel um, of uh, stink grafting. Uh, there are others which are pretty uncommon. Holes in the graft or weeping through the graft you know, are very uncommon. Type 2 common type one the most dangerous is the way of thinking about it and so here you can see uh, you can actually see these lumbars uh, when we're doing color flow doppler and so it, these are the two different ways in which you can detect this and to give you an idea of just how much blood can be coming through one of these lumbar arteries uh, and there's there's never one there's always at least two and usually more than that and they can actually this is the aneurysm being opened underneath my left hand is the stent graft pulling it to one side and we're actually having to over sew those lumbar arteries because there's enough pressure outside the endograft. The endograft, remember, is sealed top and bottom, but there's enough flow coming into that aneurysm sac that it's continuing to enlarge. These can rupture and these can be fatal, so they are not benign. And here's just an example of, you know, if you look from top left, you can see in a series of scans, you can see in a, in a, at the one o'clock position, the internal mammary artery flowing into the aneurysm, you can see the dye blooming up in the cavity and then exits through lumbar arteries. And we can now demonstrate this using dynamic CT. But we, we use this, the angiogram shows you how we can get into the inferior mesenteric artery and block it off basically with coils.
So we also can acquire CT scans in the operating room. And this is important because this is how we take your CT scan. The CT scan in Mrs. Smith that was done a month before surgery, import it into the patient. We can create a rotational acquisition with the imaging system. It allows us to map out a 3D acquisition of the bones, of the, the ribs, the pelvis, the lumbar. We fuse the pre-op CT scan with that and that allows us to actually overlay the, the die from the aorta from the CT scan and map it out basically intraoperatively. It's called image fusion and we do this essentially on every case. Anytime you see these two different colors, it means two different CT data sets being fused together and we use this to draw out what the target blood vessel, the renals are, the bifurcation are the things that we're going to use. Now there are a few weird things that you're going to see. You can sometimes see these graphs, uh, particularly the early generation, have completely come apart and their separation. Uh, those are a real problem. Sometimes on the right, the this is the early gore graph that there was weeping with the car. It would ultrafiltrate through the PTFE to change the porosity on that. And so there's a bunch of strange things that you can actually see of, of long-term follow-up of these CT scans, how they deform and how they can break. You have to follow these up for life, essentially, because uh, the, the, when you put the stent grafts in, the aneurysm remodels. It often shrinks in diameter and it can bend the stent graft and can actually cause them to come apart. So we have to follow them forever. Thoric abdominals, you know, there's a cold class classification system, you know, for that, these extend a variable length up into the visceral segment or up all the way up basically into the chest or the left subclavian. Now we have branch devices that can be used to treat these. Most of these are still in the clinical trial phase, but it's a whole different world in imaging because now we're really interested in the origin of the celiac, the origin of the SMA, the takeoff angles, because these are these CT scans it is essentially used to make to measure a stent graft basically for a patient and they're cut with holes in them they have to be accurate this is why we need high resolution thin cut slices if you get that renal fenestration as we call it often it can be very difficult to catheterize the renal you can end up losing the kidney out of it this is an example of what some of these look like you're going to see a lot more of these in the future iliac branch graft multi-branch thoracic abdominal aneurysms when we think about thoracic aneurysms by and large it's kind of the same um, we're looking at the seals on proximally and distally. Thoracic aneurysms are easier because it's really just a simple tube. However, even with that now, we're actually trying to extend up over the aortic arch into the ascending aorta. We have moved basically in a real advocates for dynamic imaging. This is a just a remarkable dynamic MR showing the, the dynamicity of the motion of that uh, flap in the descending aorta. And what's important, and here you can actually see multiple fenestrations with blood flowing to and fro through the avulsed intercostal arteries. And I think the solution to understanding the false lumen is going to be present in dynamic MR and understanding these flow patterns. What's also important in dissections for the imagers is which, what's happened to the branch vessels. Have we occluded the carotids? Have we occluded the renals? Is it dynamic occlusion, as you can see in the bottom right, or is it static occlusion? Static occlusion is when it, the, it, the false lumen thromboses and you've got this fixed obstruction. We can also take these images, whether it's MR or CT, and we can import that into the patient, as I've mentioned, fuse it on top of the patient as you can kind of see here and use this as an image guidance tool intraoperatively. It decreases the amount of radiation that we use or we're exposed to it and it decreases the amount of dye that we're going to, uh, we're going to use in the patient. And again, we, we, this is another example of just showing how we in the vascular surgery world have been based in static imaging. We've not really had the same kind of dynamic imaging as echo, for example. And when you look at this remarkable dynamic CT of an ascending aorta, it goes from almost completely open to completely occluded in one heartbeat. And the yellow marks, which you can see on the, on the screen on the right, are our targets. We can draw in where we need to land that stent graft and where we don't need to land that stent graft. And so what I would close and emphasize to you is that in the past, we just used these as diagnostic tools. Increasingly, we are taking the images that you create and placing them basically on top of the patient. And for that reason, we're becoming more and more interested in the quality of the pre-op CT scan and helping you optimize that uh, to answer the very specific questions. And I think you're going to hear from Dr. Suman Chang a little bit about some of the dynamic imaging that we've been working on, which I think is truly groundbreaking. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lumsden, for a very insightful talk, uh, full of imaging, which really kind of makes us uh, proud in the imaging department. Uh, this actually is a wrap up for our uh, morning uh, session, at least half of it. And um, we are going to take a break and um, please visit our virtual uh, exhibits uh, on your online platform. And please use paulev.com. Uh, and or text DeBakey to 37607 if you need to send any questions or comments. Um, we're going to adjourn for now, and the plan is to get back at 1030 and basically go through a myriad of carotid peripheral vascular disease imaging. Stay tuned, and we'll see you uh, at 1030.
Welcome back, everyone, and uh, good to have you among us uh, in the second half of this session, uh, focusing on aorta and peripheral vascular disease. Joined with me here in the studio is Dr. Zogby, our chairman, and it's really a truly a privilege to introduce our uh, next speaker, who is Dr. Faisal Nabi. Faisal Nabi is an assistant professor of cardiology, the director of the cardiac imaging services at Houston Methodist Willowbrook Hospital, and he is a true multimodality imager. Uh, his task today will be walking through peripheral vascular disease, should it be CT or MR imaging. Faisal, looking forward to your talk and thanks to joining us. Good morning, everyone. It's a real privilege and to be able to speak to you about peripheral vascular imaging today, should it be CT or MRI. I'd like to thank Dr. Zogby for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, peripheral arterial disease, as you know, is a very common condition affecting many millions of Americans. It's a very important marker for elevated risk of coronary artery disease, stroke, and death. And we also know that symptomatic peripheral arterial disease really can affect a patient's quality of life by limiting their functional capacity. Classically, it's diagnosed either by symptoms of claudication or physical exam findings of absent or weak pulses, or maybe the finding of an uh, arterial brewery. It's classically diagnosed with physiological tests, such as the ankle brachial index or segmental pressures, which can identify the presence or absence of significant peripheral arterial disease. So when do we need sophisticated testing such as uh, digital subtraction angiography, CT, MRI, or ultrasound? These anatomical tests generally are done whenever a diagnosis is uncertain or if a patient is a candidate for revascularization and you want to confirm and localize the degree of stenosis as well as for a complete operative planning. So in, in the gold standard, of course, of, of, not, of evaluation of anatomical evaluation of PAD is digital subtraction and geography. Um, however, it does have important limitations. This is a 2D technique only, um, and therefore you can significantly underestimate stenoses, which are eccentric in uh, nature. You are unable to visualize the vessel wall. This is strictly a luminogram. And remember, this is an invasive technique requiring arterial access and requires the use of both ionated contrast as well as ionizing radiation. Now, ultrasound is a very widely accessible test and we know it's very inexpensive and can be a great test for both anatomical and hemodynamical, hemodynamic information. And we know this technique has a very high sensitivity and specificity for a significant stenosis. However, there are limitations, especially in those with large body habituses where you may not be able to see the aortoiliac region well. The infrapopulario vessels can be very difficult to image and technically challenging, and therefore really gives you an incomplete picture. Two techniques, both CT and MRI, are, um, are, 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 what do you call it, are very important in the evaluation of peripheral arterial disease. Both of these techniques are completely non-invasive and are 3D imaging techniques. They have large field of views, high spatial resolution, and a whole host of different post pasic techniques to help us accurately evaluate uh, the arterial beds. And as I will show you, they have high diagnostic accuracy and are perfect for planning a revascularization strategy. Uh, these are just some of the different techniques we have with CT and MRI, volume membered imaging, um, multiplanar reformats, maximum intensity projections, and classical 2D uh, axial images, which can really show you the vessel lumen in great detail, the vessel wall, as well as the nature of the atheromatous plaques. You can very clearly um, evaluate eccentric lesions and can really give you um, a very accurate assessment of the entire arterial tree. These techniques, specifically here, CT, is very accurate in all arterial beds, including the aortoiliac, femoral popliteal, and tibial arteries, when comparing it to the gold standard invasive angiography. And this is similar data with MRI, also showing you a very high diagnostic accuracy. 
What about a different arterial beds? This is information on uh, the carotids. And you can see here again, if you look at these AOC curves, that both CT and MRI are very highly accurate when compared to the gold standard. And remember, these are non-invasive and therefore have no risk of stroke. Same with the renal beds. This is data from the MRA literature showing a very high diagnostic uh, accuracy technique. When the vessels become even larger, such as uh, in those patients who may already have grafts, um, you can see here, again, data from CT showing that any of these techniques can be really uh, excellent in identifying significant stenosis. There was a study that randomized patients between a strategy of MR or CT versus using ultrasound. And what this uh, technique, what this study showed us in those patients who had MRI or CT, there was higher confidence in the diagnosis and the therapeutic decision-making. There was less additional vascular imaging ordered and they were able to show costs, downstream cost savings. So how do you go about choosing between CT or MRI? And the three important things to remember are the strengths and limitations of each modality, the risks and contraindications for the technique, and the patient characteristics. CT is uh, one of its greatest strengths, of course, is it's very rapid acquisition. Uh, it's very fast, much faster than MRI. It has a large field of view and the highest of all the techniques when it comes to spatial resolution, and therefore can be great for it looking at small vessels. It has no issues with metal, and you can see here in patients who have stent, we can very accurately assess for instant restenosis. Um, however, its limitations, of course, is the blooming artifact that occurs in patients who have heavy calcium. This can lead to an overestimation of stenosis and a false positive result. And of course, this would be more common in patients who are elderly, diabetic, or, or, or renally insufficient. And then the other, of course, limitations are that we are using iodinated contrast and that can predispose certain patient populations to contrast-induced nephropathy. Uh, there is a risk of contrast allergies. And of course, this is an ionizing radiation test. And so we have to be careful in patients who are younger, who may be pregnant, or who require repeated studies. Uh, MRI has a lot of strengths as well. This is also a 3D technique with a large field of view. It has no radiation that's delivered and, no, and there's no iodinated contrast that's used. We have two particular techniques. We have both contrast enhanced techniques as well as non-contrast techniques and i'll share more about this with you later other strengths it has is dynamic imaging and the ability to actually look at the human dynamics of a particular stenosis so here's um, one of uh, the strength of mri and the limitation of ct you can see a heavily calcified vessel on the ct with many parts of the lumen being obscured and unable to accurately give it a, a, a diagnose a degree of stenosis. Mm. With, with MRA, really your uh, the calcium is not an issue whatsoever and you're able to clearly make up the lumen and identify where stenosis are present. Um, another area where MRI can be very helpful is those with patients with chronic limb ischemia. Here, this patient, you can see when using contrast enhanced techniques, there was a lot of venous contamination in the images, making the uh, the difference between artery and vein, very difficult to appreciate. Whereas if you use non-contrast techniques, which just look, are uh, just, uh, which are uh, based solely on uh, the physical principles of flowing blood, you can very nicely make out the arterial tree and evaluate for lesions. Um, and this is one particular non-contrast non uh, MRA technique uh, called KISS. And you can see here the very high sensitivity and specificity for the detection of disease, not requiring any control, contrast when compared to CTA. MRI can also be very good at uh, for dynamic imaging. And here you can act, you very nicely see uh, actively mobile dissection flap in a patient with uh, dissection. You can evaluate flow both in the true and false lumens. In this same patient, this patient uh, with further imaging in the belly, we were able to demonstrate 
the intimal flap in systole obstructing the flow to the celiac artery. And this was an example of dynamic obstruction, which resolved in, in diastole. Um, what are limitations of MRI? MRI, of course, has real problems with metal. Here's a patient with a right renal stent. And you notice here that you really cannot make any uh, inference of what's happening in the lumen because of uh, the signal void in this area. So limitations of MRI, of course, also include it has less of spatial resolution compared to CT and therefore is more difficult in smaller vessels. Um, we really cannot make out bony landmarks and it is a longer study and we have to be aware of that in patients who are uncooperative or claustrophobic. We also have to be careful in patients with metal devices, although our lab feels very comfortable imaging these patients. Um, there are a lot of labs may not feel comfortable with cardiac electronic implantable devices. And there is the issue with gadolinium contrast. Um, you know, I put here in the st stars that in general, previously we were not administering gadolinium in those with GFRs less than 30 because of the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. However, with the group two agents, uh, this is really less of an issue. So how do you image patients who may not be ideal candidates for iodinated contrast? And those are your patients with low GFRs who may not already be on hemodialysis. Of course, you would want to think of ultrasound. You would want to think of these non-contrast MRA techniques that I had discussed with you. We are now using more and more safely the group two um, gadolinium-based contrast agents. And another agent that is available is something called ferromoxetol, which was originally used to treat iron deficiency anemia. And this actually has been shown to have, have super paramagnetic properties. And you can see you can very nicely make up the arterial bed using this agent. So as I conclude, it's important to note that along with invasive anatomical assessment, there are non-invasive techniques such as ultrasound, CT, and MRA, which are given class one indications for evaluation in patients of symptomatic PAD in whom revascularization is considered. You may want to consider test advantages for CT and MRI um, when deciding which test is best. <clears throat> CT, remember we discussed, it is faster, it is higher spatial resolution for smaller vessels. You can evaluate stents with, you can see bony landmarks, uh, and it's good for patients with metal. MRI, you have to, uh, you, as you will recall, has the non-contrast enhanced techniques, which can be helpful, uh, really is not affected by the blooming artifact. It has less nephrotoxic contrast agents and it's completely radiation free. Uh, you should know what local expertise and you have available in your in your uh, in, in your area. Consider CT for those patients who are critically ill and claustrophobic, who you need a stent evaluation for. For patients already on dialysis, who may have small vessels or those with implanted medical uh, metal devices. Whereas consider MRI whenever you need function and flow. If you'd like to do repeated exams, and this especially on younger patients, those who have heavily calcified vessels, such as diabetics or patients with chronic renal insufficiency, those who have iron, iodine allergies, and when you may need uh, ferromoxetol in that patient population with very low GFRs, but not on hemodialysis. There's graphics out there that can help you choose these tests. And my final take home points are, so please consider these advanced imaging techniques uh, in a patient who's a candidate for revascularization. They all have excellent diagnostic accuracy and test choice really is based on the strength and weakness of each test, your patient's individual characteristics and the local expertise that's available. Thank you very much. All right. Um, our next speaker is, of course, my co-moderator, Dr. Chemsi Pasha, who will be speaking to us on carotid disease. How do we use imaging? Thank you, Th Mohammed. Thank you, Faisal. And uh, wonderful, elegant presentation made my life easy when I'm going to go over the nuts and bolts of CT and MR. So really, the topic in the next 15 minutes we're going to be discussing is how to use imaging in carotid disease. Why is it important? Because stroke is a disease of the elderly population. We can see on this most recent 
uh, a population study published in 2019 that up to 11 percent of people above the age of 80 will actually develop stroke which is the second most common cause of death in the u.s and carotid artery disease is responsible for almost one quarter of all strokes in the united states the diagnostic workup usually starts with carotid ultrasound which is the most widely available and has been around for decades uh, with extensive research. Carotid CTA or MRA would basically be the non-invasive cross-sectional imaging tools. Last would be the invasive angiography for basically definitive diagnosis and for planning treatment. So one of the uh, uh, historic um, markers for basically adverse cardiac events has been the carotid intimal medial thickness. We do know from the Framingham study was basically that significantly associated with risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary heart disease, death. Some of the indications basically for measuring carotid intimal medial thickness with ultrasound, people with family history of premature cardiovascular disease, people who are less than 60 years of age with severe dyslipidemia, predominantly high LDL, and people with intermediate Framingham risk score in the 5 to 20 percent range. Usually what has been uh, published and what has been extensively studied has been the distal common carotid artery for wall measurements. We can see here the right common carotid artery intimal medial thickness measured basically around 5 millimeter is the mean dimension. Plaque visualization is also critical using basically your uh, B-mode technique. So here you can see a homogeneous echogenic soft plaque on this carotid artery. And here you can see an intra-plaque hemorrhage causing this echolucency within this dense plaque uh, at the carotid bulb. Adding Doppler uh, uh, and duplex ultrasound imaging would basically allow me to obtain real-time hemodynamics assessment. There are two measurements that we usually rely upon. One of them is the peak systolic velocity, as we can see here, and then on the nadir, the end diastolic velocity. Nicely seen, here, nicely seen here is basically the color aliasing, and you can also see basically on this uh, wave, the continuous wave Doppler, the broadening uh, of that uh, jet. Um, what has been kind of published and is considered to be the consensus for both grayscale and Doppler ultrasound criteria for diagnosing internal carotid artery stenosis really re relies upon peak systolic velocity. To have a significant stenosis more than 70%, you usually have hit a velocity of more than 230. The plaque estimate would be above 50%. Some additional supporting parameter can be using this ratio of the internal uh, carotid to the common carotid artery, peak systolic velocity ratio of more than four is usually indicative of severe stenosis versus using an internal carotid artery in diastolic velocity uh, of more than 100. This is basically historic data of almost two decades ago that basically shows you on the x-axis by angiography the diameter stenosis and then on the y-axis the velocities obtained with duplex ultrasound. What we can see here basically that with a higher peak systolic velocity above 200 you really hit a diameter stenosis of above 80 percent versus basically a normal peak systolic velocity of around 160. These usually are not associated with significant stenosis probably around 25 percent. So that's basically where this uh, uh, validation comes from. Now it's very important transatlantic we actually have a different cutoff in the North America versus the European where to measure your stenosis severity at. So as we can see here by the North American we actually use the minimal uh, luminal diameter and we need to subtract it from the reference vessel distal to this area of stenosis and we're going to get a percentage of that versus if you look at the European criteria they usually go by measuring the minimal luminal diameter plus the plaque uh, in the area where there is dense uh, uh, plaque and then basically they subtract the minimal luminal diameter prior to this plaque and they take it into account when measuring stenosis severity as depicted in this algorithm. Notice that a 50% stenosis using this criteria on the left, which is used in the US, would basically correspond to a 75% stenosis uh, on the, uh, using the European uh, criteria. 
So what are some of the indications for carotid ultrasound? Obviously, a cervical brewy in an asymptomatic individual uh, as part of a workup of transient ischemic attack, stroke in a potential candidate for an endarthrectomy uh, or stent patient, and then a follow-up of a known stenosis more than 20% in an asymptomatic individual, usually done on an annual basis. Now, when we talk about the use of carotid CT angiography, as Faisal uh, beautifully demonstrated, it's a non-invasive technique. It gives you the whole spectrum of extra and intracranial three-dimensional representation of the entire carotid vasculature and basically has the highest spatial resolution among all cardiac uh, or vascular imaging modalities. Remember one of the cons that Dr. Nabi mentioned is calcium really creates blooming artifact and can overestimate stenosis severity, along with the need for contrast load in people who have impaired GFR. This is basically a carotid CTA of the patient. Um, what we can see here is there is a kink in this internal carotid artery bifurcation, but really there is no evidence of significant plaque uh, uh, in this patient. So this is a meta-analysis of 28 studies using CTA for carotid disease assessment. For significant stenosis, more than 70%, it's very sensitive and very specific in the 80 to 90% range. And for total occluded vessel, almost approaching 100% for both sensitivity and specificity. As we previously alluded to, it is very important to get a true orthogonal plane diameter perpendicular to the lumen and per perpendicular to the, to the flow, blood flow in order to not create a tangential uh, uh, cut and basically overestimate uh, stenosis uh, severity. This is actually here a patient. We're looking at the proximal internal carotid artery, and there is actually a less than 50% stenosis present uh, using the North American uh, criteria. Now, diameter versus area stenosis is different. So in that same patient where we actually looked at their 2D image, this is the 3D reconstruction of their internal carotid artery. You can see by the diameter, they have a 34% stenosis, but by area is almost approaching 56% stenosis. So remember, what has been validated and what has been published is using diameter rather than area in estimating carotid artery disease stenosis severity. This is actually a patient who right at the carotid bulb and the origin of the internal carotid artery has tremendous near circumferential calcification noted on this short axis image. This is really the Achilles heel of CT because of the volume averaging we are not able to see inside the vessel lumen. How does carotid magnetic resonance and geography look like? This is a three-dimensional rotational projection of the entire thoracic arch, the carotid bifurcations. And again, it's a non-invasive uh, imaging modality. Unlike CT, it does not carry the risk for ionizing radiation. Again, great extra and intracranial uh, 2D and 3D representation with decent spatial resolution in the magnitude of an in-plane resolution of one and a half millimeter. Calcification, as Faisal beautifully demonstrated, does not cause artifact. This is actually a 3D representation of the same carotid uh, intracranial and extracranial course. And this is actually uh, on magnetic resonance and geography using gadolinium. We can get a beautiful uh, reconstruction in 2D of all these images. To touch base a little bit about carotid plaque characterization, similar to myocardial infarction, strokes do occur in non-obstructive carotid disease. CTMR plus PET will actually really have the potential to characterize the plaque composition along with the disease activity. So this is here a uh, literature published from CT, which actually nicely demonstrates a lipid-rich cholesterol plaque in this internal carotid artery with a Hounsfield unit of less than 60. This is a patient who has a fibrotic plaque with a Hounsfield unit in 60 to 130 versus a patient who has a more of a dense calcified plaque within their internal carotid artery. So really beyond stenosis, let's think about unstable plaque. This is actually what we refer to thin cap, large lipid core uh, uh, plaque, and these really pretends to high risk. This is actually here a picture from an in vivo CTA with a CTA overlay showing you those mixed compositions of fibro fatty, fatty, along with basically calcified uh, plaques within this area. And you can actually nicely see a beautiful 70% agreement with histology after end arthrectomy, as we can actually see here on histology compared to the CT overlay. 
Uh, where does PET play a role? This was kind of a nice study published two years ago uh, showing a multi-parametric assessment of patients' carotid arteries post-TIA. What you see the, on this three-dimensional magnetic resonance angiography is a very complex external carotid artery plaque. And this actually plaque on MRI has a very high T1 signal intensity, which usually indicates and is very suspicious for a thrombus. And when we use PET using sodium fluoride imaging, which we do know basically usually gets uptaken in inflammatory atherosclerotic plaque, we can nicely see the high signal intensity. This might open up the future for more research in order to define vulnerable plaque as we have done in coronary imaging. So my final slide, ladies and gentlemen, people with suspected extracranial carotid disease Carotid duplex ultrasonography will be the first line imaging modality. If the patient has less than 50% stenosis, then they would undergo follow-up duplex ultrasound. People with more than 50% stenosis in the appropriate clinical setting, then basically you would use a cross-sectional imaging, either MR or CT based on your local expertise, along with availability and basically if they do agree with the duplex ultrasound then basically you have the options for referring patients for endarthrectomy versus carotid artery stenting we do know basically that people who have occluded cranial intracranial vessels or extracranial vessels then there is really no data to suggest that intervening would change outcomes and these people would need appropriate follow-up with duplex ultrasound with that i would like to conclude and thank you for your attention That's great. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Shamsi Pasha, for... Uh, I, I, to tell you the truth, I was not aware of the differences between, you know, the criteria between uh, the European as well as... And that's quite a difference. Yeah, almost a 25% difference. So I guess people have to be... have to know the locale and the, and the implications of such differences. Uh, why don't we... Uh, there you go. I'm looking at uh, our questions here. So much great information in the last three days. Any major milestones or breakthroughs around the corner? Well, actually, <laughs> quite a few of those were, were talking about what the future, what's, I mean, PET, for example, for, for carotids, I think would be uh, amazing to see whether we could do uh, some prediction of events in addition to um, uh, usual uh, anatomic measurements. Uh, Dr. Shamsi Pasha, you want to start with some of the cases? Absolutely. Is this what you want to do? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the time to go over interesting cases and panel discussion. Uh, I will be uh, presenting along with uh, my mentor, Dr. John Mamarian, the director of cardiac CT and nuclear at Houston Methodist uh, Hospital. So um, this case starts with a 52 years old uh, male patient who basically has no significant past medical history. He came in with chief complaint of sharp chest pain along with dyspnea on exertion. We can notice that he has um, elevated blood pressure in the 150s over 70s and his heart rate is actually bradycardic and he has normal uh, pulse oximetry. He basically, when he showed up, had a CTPE protocol that was done at the emergency department and there was no pulmonary embolism but was noted to have an apparent 2.6 centimeter filling defect within the right ventricle. Patient was referred to us for further evaluation and management, and we start with his peristernal long axis echocardiogram, and we can actually see pretty decent LV size and function, no significant valvular abnormalities that we see here. But the money shot basically is when you do his peristernal short axis view. So here's the right coronary cusp, this is the left coronary cusp, this is the non coronary cusp, and you can see actually here this almost rounded shape mass that's actually protruding into the right ventricular outflow tract. Contrast was appropriately administered. Uh, in this case, this is the peristernal long axis view. So this is the LV anteroceptal wall. And again, you actually see this very 
dense uh, with really a lack of contrast enhancement, at least on this first pass infusion. And it appears to be largely immobile, but it's really seen kind of protruding into the right ventricular outflow tract. And this is what the mass uh, looks like on this peristernal short axis view. Um, before I tell you what the echo impression was, i um, kind of curious to see whether Dr. Zogby has um, any uh, thoughts about um, and any additional imaging that you would consider in order to evaluate this. Hmm. Uh, it's an interesting one because my first thought was, uh, could this be an aneurysm of the sinus of the Alsalva, maybe with or without communication? But you took care of that, uh, Dr. Shamsi Pasha, with a contrast, and the contrast tells you that there is no uh, perfusion in that. So either it's an occluded, uh, either a mass or a, um, a uh, thrombosed area. But I, I don't think it's related to the coronary sinus. That's my, that's my initial you know, uh, assessment. And it could be a mass. Excellent. I mean, that's literally, literally what they said. They said there is an immobile uh, 1.7 by 2 centimeter mass seen in the RV attached to the septum by a thin stalk, and there was no contrast enhancement. And really, the differential here is this a thrombus that we're looking at, or is this a tumor? And as Dr. Mamarian, uh, since he's here, and since we say that CT is king, they decided to do <laughs> uh, a cardiac uh, CTA on this patient. And let me actually play through this uh, image. So. What we're seeing actually here is basically a cross-section um, axial cut through the heart. And what I want to try to point out to you is basically this right sinus of Valsalva. This is the ascending aorta. This is the left coronary cusp coming here. And what you wanna, want you to notice is basically there is a bulging mass that appears to be coming out from the right sinus of Valsalva, and it's protruding almost uh, 20 millimeter into the right ventricle. On this first pass uh, uh, injection, there was no enhancement uh, of this mass whatsoever and really kind of an ugly looking uh, mass that appears to be at the right sinus of Valsalva. This is actually a short axis view at the aortic valve level, so it's almost reproducing what we saw on the uh, uh, echo. And what I want to point out here is the right coronary cusp. And then again, you see this very hypodensity, uh, large, almost a two centimeter mass that's actually protruding into the right ventricle. But it seems to be kind of confined within the uh, uh, um, uh, region or the borders of the right coronary cusp. The left and the non-coronary cusp appears to be within normal size. But clearly, the sinus to commissure uh, size of the right coronary cusp looked dilated. This is actually a long axis three chamber view, again, very similar to what we saw in echo. Here's the aortic valve, the anteroceptal wall, the inferolateral wall. And again, we basically point out to this hypodensity and the right sinus of Valsalva that's actually protruding into the right ventricle. So one of the things that Dr. Zogby was concerned about, could this have been a ruptured right sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, but it actually has a contained overlying thrombus. What I'm trying to show on this 3D volume rendered image, the aneurysm volume is almost a 57 uh, centimeter cubic, and the thrombus volume is actually occupying almost half of this uh, sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. For better tissue characterization, uh, patient underwent and prior to surgical planning, they did undergo cardiac MR, and this is actually a short axis view of the aortic valve, again, showing the continuity of this thrombus within the borders of the right sinus of Valsalva. This is a three chamber view showing basically the aortic valve and the right sinus of Valsalva with this almost kind of occlusive thrombus. Uh, but you can see actually why people thought it was in the right ventricle because it is actually protruding significantly into the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the pulmonic valve, this is the mass, and you can beautifully see here the continuation of the line of this mass along with the right sinus of Valsalva. It is not a ventricular septal defect, obviously, because it's occurring above the aortic annulus. So this patient underwent some tissue characterization with uh, CMR. So on the T1, it looks like it had uh, what appears to be a high-dense high uh, signal intensity. And then on the T2 fat saturation, it did not become saturated, meaning that it's less likely to be a lipoma. And what we notice on our special CMR imaging is basically using the sequence of TI-600, which is specific for 
clots, avascular structures will not pick up any gadolinium uptake. And that's why we see this area kind of predominantly black. Uh, interestingly enough, when actually we did the late scar imaging using 3D imaging, so this is actually, again, the short axis view of the right coronary cusp, we actually see the clot, but around it, there is actually a very intense signal intensity, which normally we do not see that in the setting of clots. Having said that, one of the reasons why this could have been occurred is if I have a fresh acute thrombus, then basically these fresh acute thrombus could have some small micro channels and they could actually retain uh, gadolinium agents and they can enhance uh, uh, on late scar imaging. Dr. McGillivray was with us this morning and when he took the patient to the operating room, there was a defect in the right sinus of Valsalva, but not to the right coronary ostium and the defect was chalk full of thrombus. <laughs> patient underwent successful repair of the sinus of Valsalva aneurysm with the photofix bovine pericardium. And finally, the pathology of this case showed severe atherosclerosis and an acute thrombus formation uh, uh, with severe attenuation and loss of vascular wall tissue consistent with aneurysm formation. All the other infectious workup were completely unremarkable and there was no signs of vasculitis on this patient. Very nice, very nice case. So that was really good. Let me just make one comment though. I mean, the CT was diagnostic. You didn't really need the MRI. I mean, the CT, I read this study actually, I remember it very well. And uh, he had clearly a bulging sinus of Alsalva and the Hounsfield units in that area were around 50, which is classic for clot. If it had been minus 100, it would have been classic for lipo lipoma. And um, so, you know, I'm, it was nice to get the MR, but it wasn't necessary. Sure. But uh, I think the beauty of advanced imaging here, I, I tell you, from the echocardiogram, you saw it, but you could not see that this is really part of the sinus of Vesalvi because you couldn't see that continuity. And, and here, number one, you could, you could follow the sinus of Vesalvi uh, and its aneurysm. And also you see that the border between this dense mass and the coronary uh, and, the, and the sinus of Valsalva is irregular. So you know it is a continuity as opposed to something adjacent from the outside. Great case. Thank you. Dr. Mamari, you want to share some cases? Sure, with us? I'd love to. Um, so let's just start off with one case here. This is a 58-year-old uh, uh, gentleman, prior procedure for, for congenital heart disease in August of 2010, returned with progressive decrease in exercise tolerance, worsening shortness of breath with exertion. Echocardiogram showed normal EF in the 50s, enlarged RV and RV hypokinesis. Uh, EKG was really nonspecific. This is what his uh, CTA showed. We did a CTA because he was having some shortness of breath and chest discomfort. He actually has rather clean coronary arteries. You can see the uh, LAD here, the first obtuse marginal, the circumflex here, and the right coronary artery, this being the uh, posterior descending artery, which are uh, totally normal. So no significant coronary atherosclerosis. This is what his, uh, what his axial images look like on CT. And I want you to keep in mind this little structure here. This is the aorta. This is the pulmonary artery, okay? These are the, this is the left atrial appendage. Here's the coronaries here, okay? And um, we're coming down here and I think you'll notice something of a defect here in, this, in the atrial septum, okay? And this PD here. So in this particular individual, when we, when we look at these uh, images, uh, we can see, first of all, there is a secundum ASD. You can see there's left to right shunting from the left atrium into the right, into the right atrium. You can see this RV enlargement. Um, and you can see it in this view too. You can see this is the left atrium. This is the right atrium and there's uh, shunting of blood. It turns out uh, that the, uh, the uh, shunt was significant. It was uh, 2.8 to 1. And um, what's also interesting about this case is that you see this, this object up here. And 
What it actually is, is a prior occluder device, mm. which was uh, preventing, I mean, which was in the, uh, hopefully in the, uh, placed in the ASD at some, at some point in time, and had migrated uh, up into the aorta. You can see this is the, um, is the left carotid, this is the left carotid here, the, the brachycephalic trunk here. So it was like just situated uh, in the aortic arch. And um, you can see on a 3D image. No uh, symptoms from that. Very, no doubt about what that looks like. In fact, you can see it here also. And it looks exactly like this, which is what it was, uh, which is a uh, gore helix septal occluder. Okay. So, so this particular patient actually went for a surgical procedure. I'm not going to show you the whole surgical procedure, but the, the bottom line is that he was having worsening symptoms due to an ASD that was still, un that was still uh, wide open. And uh, so in this surgical procedure, they basically removed the, uh, the device from the, aortic, from the aortic arch and also uh, uh, fixed the, the hole in the ASD. <laughs> so hopefully that'll be a more permanent fix. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, let me show you another case. This is an 81-year-old patient with heart failure. And, uh, you know, we use CT a lot to look at the aorta and also to look at valves. And um, in this particular case, you'll notice that the valve is quite dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Okay? Quite a bit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, she was having shortness of breath and heart failure symptoms. And uh, the peak velocity by echo is 4.3 uh, meters per second squared. So, I mean, it's, it, was a, it was a rather significant uh, gradient. And you'll also notice that she has these abnormalities here, and you can see that the Hounsfield units are about 150. So that would be rather atypical for thrombus. Okay? They're not seeing your cursor, so you might want to describe can it Can you a bit. see right here? Um, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think we're seeing. You're they, not they, seeing the, the cursor. Soft, uh, the soft um, density Yeah, well, you can see it. Where, the, where it says Hounsfield units. You can yes, see yes. the arrow basically going to that black area right underneath the cusp. Got it. And, um, and that is the, uh, that's the, uh, a very high Hounsfield unit. That would be more consistent with a panis than it would be with thrombus. But it turns out also on the other side of that cusp, and if you look at the, at the picture below, that the Hounsfield units are only 26 to 28. And so that would be more consistent with thrombus. And in fact, um, at this juncture, because we would think that this was the situation, that it was thrombus, so this would be panis as you can see with the very high Hounsfield units, and this would be thrombus uh, with the very low Hounsfield units. And so this so is what, what we what typically would, do. What would you we, do? I'm sorry? What would you do in such a patient? Would okay, well, we're going to talk about that in one second okay. because now that we know based on Hounsfield units what that would be done, uh, this patient actually went for uh, therapy. And if you look at this is pre, and this is post. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rather dramatic, and the panis side didn't change at all on the right, but the other leaflet now is moving dramatically, right? Yes. And you can see that the clot now on the one side is completely resolved. And what this patient basically got was uh, ultra slow throm thrombolytic therapy in hospital, which is uh, really kind of a nice way to, uh, to kind of alleviate these, these thrombi. And she did quite well. So her gradient actually went down quite nicely. It went from 4.3 meters per second down to uh, 2.9 meters per second, and she became relatively asymptomatic. I mean, that's, that's conceivably also the reason why thrombolytic therapy may not be completely curative. Because, exactly. you know, we've had uh, that ProTE registry that published in, I guess, 2009, looking at the effectiveness and safety of thrombolytic therapy. If they are large, you'll get concerned about it with previous uh, uh, stroke greater than eight, uh, 0.8 centimeters squared. So it, it was not too large to start with. But, um, you know, the history tells us that it's either under anticoagulated this, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. individual, they have to exactly. be very careful about that, 
but also they may have a mixture of thrombus and paras. And actually, in many of these cases, they, they are placed on anticoagulation as an outpatient and come back for repeat imaging. In this particular patient, because she was so symptomatic, it was decided to use uh, uh, you know, thrombolytic therapy. Great case. Dr. Shamsi Pasha, you got a case? Yeah, sure. I have a question, Dr. Mamerian. When it comes to metal and uh, how would we be able to discriminate between growth like panis or thrombus versus streak artifacts uh, okay. in the setting of uh, metallic mechanical Well, I mean, you bring up a bumps. good point in terms of CT. Uh, actually, what we like to try to do is, is image people at higher uh, KV, first of all, to try to avoid some of the beam hardening that you would see and the streaks. Um, and then there are always areas within that, within that, even if you have some areas of uh, beam hardening, there are always going to be some areas that are, that are not affected because usually that's a, very, that's a very discrete area. And beam hardening, the Houseville units there are usually extremely low, you know, minus 200, et cetera. So you're able to distinguish between what would be beam hardening and what would be um, uh, panis, for instance. Got it. Okay, Dr. Pasha. Excellent. Um, let me see if I can. That's a great case, actually, there. Did the patient do well? Rather? Very well. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully still At doing well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a 58-years-old uh, um, male patient, has had history of end-stage non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and systemic lupus erythematosus on steroids, uh, was admitted with decompensated heart failure, has basically elevated JVP and systolic murmur on exam, and an echocardiogram was ordered for functional and hemodynamics assessment. And I'm very pleased to have Dr. Zogby right next to me because obviously it really takes no um, uh, one not to visualize this large, ugly looking mass at the uh, tricuspid uh, valve annulus or atrioventricular groove, whatever you want to call it. But you can actually see that this patient has a very severely dilated, severely dysfunctional left ventricle with paradoxical septal motion. And you really have this large kind of circumferential echogenic, but in the, ce in the center of it, it almost looks more echolucent. Uh, we do have basically an unzoomed uh, view of the same uh, mass. And what is really kind of striking is how this mass is very well circumscribed. This is actually an image on the subcostal view, and it seems to be kind of moving in sync with the cardiac uh, uh, cycles. So, um, no contrast was administered in this case, and I'm curious, Dr. Zagbe, to what would be the um, um, kind of the differential of, of this um, we mass? We would, would love to have some, some um, contrast here to tell us whether there is any perfusion, yes or no. It's a cystic mass, uh, and I think in the differential of a cystic mass should be a, um, a cavernous uh, or hemangiomas like uh, situations where. Uh, they can, if they are quite large, they may do some obstruction. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what the gradient was across this tricuspid valve. I, I suspect there would be some. Uh, I don't know if it's related to the dyspnea, although you have left ventricular dysfunction with it. But I think that's, in a cystic mass, uh, the other are infectious, uh, high dadded cysts or, or others. But I think that's, um, that's uh, in a way, the differential diagnosis for this. Yeah, I mean, it's a very unusual location, and basically very few things would cause this. But surprisingly, when the patient has had a cardiac CT, what I want to show you here, the proximal right coronary artery, this is the lumen, this is the wall. It's a markedly enlarged and aneurysmal right coronary artery, and what we see actually is a thrombus kind of filling this right. The patient has pacemaker leads on the right side, and then we're really kind of the area right at the tricuspid annulus. You actually have this four centimeter uh, uh, aneurysmal right coronary artery. And what we see here in this hypodense area with a Hansfeld unit of 40 to 50 is a large, thankfully not occlusive because still the right coronary artery appears to have decent uh, uh, flow, but we can see that the vessel is heavily calcified uh, in this patient with lupus uh, and is on steroids. So when the patient was actually taken to the invasive coronary angiography, really showed non-obstructive uh, coronary artery disease. And this was actually a case of a partially thrombosed RCA aneurysm incidentally discovered uh, on an echocardiogram 
obviously the patient uh, was having heart failure symptoms, so really she proceeded, oh, I'm sorry, he proceeded with workup for advanced uh, heart failure therapy, but I thought that there was kind of a um, very unusual location uh, of a well-circumscribed thrombosed aneurysm that is rarely seen uh, these days, uh, apart from maybe Kawasaki patients, um, but that was kind of the... Um, the interesting so I'm kind finding. of interested. There, there was no evidence of a shunt of any kind, right? Because a lot of times those large coronary arteries, especially down to where, at the, in the, we've seen them in the right coronary artery, where they, where you have shunts from, for instance, the coronary sinus, etc., and they can become extremely uh, patulent. So that was not the case. Doesn't look like based on the right heart cath data. No. Very Great. Dr. Nabi, do you have a case that you want to show? <laughs> Absolutely. I have uh, a two small quick ones. We'll kind of change gears here. I'm just going to optimize. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, are you all able to yes, see the we're, screen here? Yes, we're able to see it. Okay. So we have a 58-year-old female who was actually referred to our institution here for excision of an LV myocardial mass that was seen on echo. And uh, this is not an infrequent uh, decision tree that happens. Uh, you know, uh, abnormalities are seen where a tertiary referral center. And oftentimes, in, in order for, you know, preoperative planning, really for the surgeons to get a, a really a complete evaluation, you know, an MRI of a cardiac mass is frequently obtained. And you can see here a short axis, two chamber, and a kind of a modified three chamber. You see this structure here, which almost looks like a pap muscle, but it's not. These two are the pap muscles over here. And you can see this kind of attached to the anterior wall in the mid segment. And if you look at this kind of long chamber view, you kind of see it uh, floating here towards the apex as well. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the benefits, of course, I mean, with, when it comes down to figuring out what a mass is, uh, we're frequently left with, you know, what structure does it occupy? And that often gives us insight as to what the potential etiology may be. Um, uh, but of course, with CMR, we can go a little bit further. So uh, we have the ability to do tissue characteristics. And so we can actually look how this particular mass, and uh, I'm just going to point it out to you here, behaves in different uh, T1 environments. So here we have T1, we've got T2 environments, how it behaves in these different, uh, you know, uh, pulse sequences. Then you have your late gadolinium hand sequences, how it would behave there. And finally, what it would look like under first pass perfusion. So I'll just kind of take you through this. This particular mass you can see here is bright on T1. On T2 with fat saturation, you can, the mass completely uh, disappears and uh, you're unable to see it, and it really looks gray on LGE. And if you look at it on first pass perfusion, you know, it really does not have significant contrast uptake. So, uh, Mohammed, what do you think? So can you translate this for a clinician? <laughs> if it is bright on T1, what does that mean? If it is, yes. if it is not bright on T2, what does it mean? So at least we, we know a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So anything that is not the normal myocardium will be bright on a T1 sequence. So if it's fat, if it's fluid, if it's water, you know, if as, as soon as the myocardium is not a normal myocardial texture, it's going to be bright. When we get to T2 with fat saturation, this is a specific sequence that is looking for edema. So, um, um, and what it does is it, it, it wants only edema, edema to show up bright, whereas everything else, including fat, to be suppressed. And then finally, LGE, as you know, is uh, looking for contrast uptake, which often you know, tells you whether there's necrosis or uh, infarct present. And first pass perfusion really is for vascularity. So in this particular mass, you, know, you see a brightness on T1. So that tells you that uh, this is not your normal myocardium. There's something abnormal about it but it instantly suppresses and nulls on T2. And there's only one particular thing that does this. This is very, very characteristic for fat. Uh, and this turns out to be a lipoma. This is what we call our uh, 
T1 map here also showing you that the T1 values of this are very, very low. Fat ha tends to have, you know, the fastest T1 times. So uh, it just, you know, by color coding parametric map here, just kind of, you know, a quick eyeball, it tells you that again, that this is fat. And um, this patient actually, you know, for although we had made the diagnosis of an intracardial uh, lipoma, this patient did go on to get a PET CT. Um, you can see here by just tracing out a region of interest of this mass, again, almost minus 82, also very, very, you know, uh, another very specific way to identify masses is to look at the Hounsfield unit and this minus anywhere from, you know, minus from minus 50 to minus 100 is very, very specific for fat. And you can see really it didn't take up much FDG. Um, you know, so really actually this CMR was very helpful for this patient because it kind of averted, you know, the need for surgery. Uh, this patient really had no arrhythmias, really didn't have any stroke symptoms. Uh, the physicians decided just to watch this. This is his CMR four years later, same size, behaving exactly the same way um, as our initial study, really showing stability of this lipoma. Um, I have another one, Dr. Zogby, based on whatever your time needs are. All right. Uh, I think well, Dr. Mamarian probably has one, but I think it's an important point since we talked about masses here, right? Uh, I think we should caution people if the mass is, is very small and very, very mobile that you may not see it as well on neither MRI nor CT and you have to do something. You, you may have to alert you know, the imager to, to change maybe their acquisition in a way for you to be able to see it. I mean, that's why also vegetations are not seen as well because they're small and very mobile. So. You need to know the advantage of each one. If you're not seeing something, I think, and you want to see whether there's a mass, at least you cannot characterize it well, except with contrast, echo slash TE would see it well in a way. But you want to characterize it more. MRI, I think, would be with all the sequences that you've shown. Uh, I actually can tell you about, you know, fat, thrombus, et cetera, et cetera. So you could do that. And... Uh, I think CT is important, but it's not going to tissue characterize it. Yeah. Right? Do you guys agree? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely Dr. Sarbi. You know, uh, when we're reading in these advanced techniques, we are frequently going back and looking at the echoes or requesting, you know, information from the uh, referring physicians because it is so important that we actually go back and review the echo images because you're absolutely right. Our echo image and our CMR images are made over many cardiac cycles. So if you have an image that's small, very rapidly mobile, you are, you know, the computer is not going to know where to assign it on yeah, as you reconstruct these images and you, you may actually not even see it. So it is really important, behooves us to really review imaging before the patient gets to the lab uh, in order to make sure we try our best to identify what physicians are looking for. That's great. John? Sure. So uh, let me just show you two quick, uh, two quick cases. This is a uh, relatively young 40-ish uh, year old woman who uh, had a prior surgical procedure. I'm going to show you her axial images. So we're coming down here, and I think you can already appreciate this is the aorta. This is a dissection, okay? And uh, so prior dissection, and this is the false lumen, this is the true lumen. Almost invariably, the true lumen is always smaller than the false lumen. And uh, as we come down, you can still see the dissection flap here. The dissection flap here ends because this is a graft. Okay, so the patient previously had probably a type A dissection or DeBakey 1 and, um, you know, had grafting of the ascending aorta, residual type B dissection. And um, now is coming in with more, with, with what she complained of, exertional chest pain. So the question is, what is the reason for the exertional chest pain? And uh, we're coming down here, and um, this is the left main coronary artery. Okay, and it looks really pretty good. I mean, there's nothing abnormal here. There is this abnormality here. 
This is the right coronary artery here, the LED coming down, the circumflex. The coronary arteries look pretty normal. And the rest of the, the, rest of the study is a relatively normal study. So let's go on. So anyway, this was a, um, let's here show this first. So what you see here, very similar to what Mohammed showed before without a clot, is you have this huge dilation of the, uh, the uh, non-carnary sinus, the left, okay? And I'm sorry, the left sinus of Valsalva. And this is the graft, okay, that's the aortic graft. So obviously when they did this, they, they started at the sinotubular junction and went up and grafted. Now we're left with this. And what you can also see is that now there's severe compression of the left main coronary artery. So here you have the pulmonary artery. Here you have the left sinus of Alsalva, and this is this poor left main that is really <laughs> extremely compressed uh, by, that, by that aneurysm. So this patient uh, went for root resection, had a placement of an aortic valve. She also had other issues with aortic insufficiency, et cetera and had reimplantation of her uh, of her left main. So I mean I think it's you know you have to always understand people who have vascular disease they always come back or many times they come back with other complications from the vascular disease they had originally. And uh, this was kind of an unusual presentation of angina in a patient really who had uh, compromise of her coronary arteries due to a vascular complication in aortic root uh, uh, in, uh, and, and prior uh, surgery uh, because of that with dissection previously. Beautiful. Very, very nice. I can show you one other case that I think you'll find interesting. Um, this is in a 92-year-old patient. Um, she also came in with chest pain symptoms, atypical. These are her coronary arteries. You can see the LAD circumflex and right. This is a 92-year-old. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope my coronaries look like that when I'm 92 <laughs> years old. I tell you, it's, just, it's absolutely beautiful. Non-obstructive coronary disease. But she did have other problems, okay? And uh, you can see here, this is the, uh, the distal ascending uh, thoracic aorta. And this is a, a classic type two dissection, okay? This is a very limited dissection in the, in the mid to distal ascending thoracic aorta. And uh, this was the reason for the patient's uh, uh, chest discomfort. You go, can see it comes all the way down here and look at this here, okay? So this is the true lumen, this is the false lumen. Okay. John, do, do you do, I presume you do, but I wanna mention that to the audience. Uh, in our lab, do you do your CT ECG gated? Yes. Oh, that's a very important point. Because this is where some of the artifacts and then the, the, the wonder whether there is dissection, yes or no, because of yes. blurring of the image. Could you emphasize that if you don't mind? And, and uh, yeah, I would like to say that I, I didn't even bring it up, Bill, because it's something that we do routinely. Do, I know you do that <laughs> routinely. So, so you're but, absolutely right. Our so our colleagues, the radiologists, don't do that often. Most of the time they never, don't. Exactly. Actually. Uh, so we have to be very careful about that. If you, if you look at the ascending aorta, it is extremely mobile. Now the descending aorta is retroperitoneal and does not move, and actually you don't need to gate those particular images as necessarily, but the ascending aorta absolutely must be um, it can be very pulsatile, that's the issue. I mean, it can be, depending on the output and so many other things and, and compliance, it can be very pulsatile and just imagine a little motion. Well, here you go. There you go, so. so and in fact, in this particular patient, um, you can see the flap moving. And I just wanna make just, and actually she had, we thought she actually had a, a possible a fibroelastoma here too, because you can see it coming in and out of, out of focus. But um, one thing I do want to emphasize is that one thing we also look for, and we do non-contrast studies on all of these patients, is the issue of intramural hematoma. And intramural hematoma, as you can see here in this particular patient, is uh, usually on a non-contrast study is shown as this crescent-shaped area. And look at this. This is on a non-contrast study. So 
Anytime we have a patient with a potential vasculopathy, we always do a non-contrast study first to make sure we're not dealing with intramural hematoma and then proceed with the contrast study. Yes. And that's just an example how that might look. Very that's good. intramural hematoma. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll ask Dr. Shamsi Pasha to present his last case, and I think uh, <laughs> then uh, there's one or two questions from the audience and reflections, and we'll right, call it uh, a day. So um, thanks, Dr. Zogby. So this is a 58 years old gentleman with history of hyperlipidemia and a skin mole that was treated with a wide local excision 10 years ago, had a very unfortunate out-of-hospital VF arrest for which he was card diverted, and he achieved ROSC. They basically did an left coronary heart angiography that really showed non-obstructive disease. He had an echocardiogram for which we didn't have the images, but reportedly he w was told that he had apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for which an ICD was placed and was discharged home on Sotolol. Unfortunately, he had 22 subsequent ICD shocks for true sustained VT or VF and then was admitted for initiation of antiarrhythmic agents. This was basically his echocardiogram that showed kind of a um, pretty normal LV systolic function on the peristernal long axis view. But I hope you all agree with me on this apical four chamber view that there is a protruding mass, echo dense large mass inside the LV, from the LV apex into the LV cavity. On the two chamber view, there is also another kind of texture of mass that's kind of look more hypoechoic and hyperechoic within the basal inferior wall. And again, we see this large mass protruding into the LV apex, more li mostly pedunculated with echogenicity. So I hope you all agree with me that this does not look like apical <laughs> HCM. And obviously the guy was referred for a magnetic resonance and geography for mass and scar assessment. What you all appreciate here is basically this pathological uh, um, thickness of this inferior wall, which really has a different texture than the remainder of the myocardium. On this apical view, you can actually see nicely the mass protruding into the LV apical segments originating from the myocardium. You can actually see the guy has already an ICD lead, and thankfully he still had great diagnostic image quality. He really has a reverse septal curvature, as we can see here, but the tissue characterization of this, it looks more hyper intense rather than the normal hypertrophy that we see in people with asymmetric HCM. Again, we see in the background this apical mass that you can beautifully see it on this apical two-chamber view. Large mass from the apex pedunculating into the LV. And if you remember on the echocardiogram, we had this texture mass mm -hmm. that looked kind of of mixed signal intensity that did not appear to be coming uh, or basically had normal myocardial tissue. This is again the mass from the LV apex. As Faisal alluded to, on the T1 weighted image, this look had the same intensity as the myocardium. But then on the T2 weighted image, which usually lights up in cases of edema, there is a very high signal intensity within these areas. When we do administer gadolinium and we look at the perfusion, there is definitely late gadolinium contrast uptake. And that usually suggests vascularity of these growths, which are no longer hypertrophic segments, but mostly tumorous. And then really kind of the hallmark uh, of this is basically the multi-patch scar uptake in all the segments of the heart in the anterior apical along with the inferior wall so really the cmr findings were highly suggestive of a primary cardiac neoplasm and or a cardiac metastasis things that really gives you this high vascularity and high degree of fibrosis are either sarcomas fibromas or cardiac mets when the patient underwent a whole body fdg uptake you can nicely see the intense myocardial uptake of this lv apical segment along with the septum and because of the mass along with the incessant vt he did undergo endomyocardial biopsy the staining of which was strongly positive for s100 which we all know basically goes along with metastatic cardiac melanoma for his prior skin mole that was treated over 10 years ago so obviously the take-home message, um, well, before that, af after three months of immunotherapy, the guy had the repeat cardiac MRI and all these masses in his LV apex and inferior wall, they have completely resolved after successful three months of immunotherapy treatment. Take a look at this apical four chamber view. This reversed septal curvature is back to a normal contour and there is no longer a mass in his LV apex. And the resolution of the intense FDG uptake that we saw before immunotherapy 
and after we have normal physiological myocardial uptake of glucose. So really the take home message hypertrophy has a lot of mimickers and we are really kind of uh, grateful for this institution for having all advanced cardiac imaging modality under one umbrella because truly was crucial in guiding biopsy, diagnosing a very rare cardiac metastatic lesion with an unconventional path to healing uh, in this patient. And I would like to conclude with this quote from Dr. DeBakey, often a healing takes place in ourselves as we pray for the healing of others. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamsi Pasha, a great case. And actually, it, it also speaks for the power of immunotherapy. And hopefully this gentleman, you know, uh, does well. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is that time of the day, and um, I cannot thank enough. First, uh, our moderators for today, Dr. Faisal uh, Nabi and Dr. Shamsi Pasha, and our adult congenital heart disease specialists, um, and in addition to our surgeons to uh, end the symposium on adult congenital heart disease and, and the vasculature. But most importantly, I cannot thank you enough for you being with us. There was a question uh, said, uh, would this uh, symposium be available to us, um, to the viewers? Certainly, they will be available for you for two months if you if you registered for the course. And, uh, and uh, I think await some more communication after we do some editing, et cetera, so that it will be available for you because there's a lot of material for you to go through. I know you cannot be sitting in your chair or uh, lounging on your couch uh, for two and a half days. So, you know, take the time, review them. And certainly we're always here to help you navigate, uh, you know, a difficult situation. So you could always email us. Uh, get in touch with us in so many ways and we're uh, available also on Twitter uh, so uh, w whatever format nowadays that you want to be in touch knowledge is so available nowadays and we can communicate so much easier so it should not be difficult for you to update yourself and I'm glad that you've taken the time to update yourself and uh, it's always good to take some professional time so that you know you get better and better at it and also for people who have been in this field for some time, as you could tell from the first day, tremendous advances that have occurred within just a few years. So you have to keep up. The field keeps changing. And uh, I think we all learn in this field. And we're very excited that the field is not static. So with that, I cannot thank you enough for you being with us for the last two and a half days. And we look forward to seeing you again, either in conferences in between or next year in our 12th annual multimodality imaging course. Thanks again.